Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the OGC Testbed 19 demonstration days with our focus on interoperability and collaboration from oceans to space. I'm Rachel Opitz. I work in the uh, COSY team, the Collaborative Solutions and Innovation team at the OGC. And we are really excited to have you here today to see demonstrations and presentations from the participants in the Testbed 19. So, jumping right in, for those of you who are not familiar, with the OGC, I wanted to explain to you a little bit about what we do and why we have these test beds and where they fit into our innovation process. So the OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium, is an organization, a membership organization that brings together a large community with more than 550 organizations from governments to startups to work on today's most critical challenges and to develop innovative solutions that let us leverage geospatial data and technologies to address these challenges from climate and disaster resilience through bringing together data in the marine domain, connecting hydrology to coast to the ocean, to really developing the new data standards and file formats that are going to create the geospatial web and technologies of the future. And we do all of this by developing and encouraging and promoting the adoption of open community-driven geospatial standards. And we are today going to see the outcomes of some of that work and particularly of the work that takes place in the OGC Collaborative Solutions and Innovation Problem, which is the problem solving and new ideas exploration body of the OGC. So we bring together organizations to sponsor and participate in, so really actively contribute to initiatives that include sprints and pilots and the focus of today, test beds, to sh solve shared problems by advancing and applying science and technology techniques that will really drive and enable integration going forward. And this is really the process that feeds the next generation of standards that helps us to update existing standards and helps us to develop best practices for geospatial data sharing and interoperability, helps us promote fair data, and helps us to put innovative solutions into practice. So one of the really exciting things about the test beds, and for those of you who don't know, test beds are our really premier activity that brings together a wide range of sponsors to address fundamental early stage challenges in geospatial technologies. You know, so within these test beds, we really address these geospatial sector wide priorities, the most important challenges that we have. And we are going to see this year the outcomes from the test bed 19. The areas of focus that we're going to be highlighting these challenges include geospatial data and how it's being used in space. This is a really exciting area of activity and we're excited to share with you the outcomes of Testbed 19 on it, really imagining into the future how it's going to be when we need to be able to deploy, deploy spatial technologies, coordinate around coordinate systems, and promote the use of spatial data and technology for deep space exploration. When we go as a human community to Mars, we are going to be using geospatial technology on other planets. Um, when we eventually, in an imagined future, leave the solar system, we will need to use geospatial technologies there. How do we envisage geospatial in space? So you're going to hear all about that today and the very early stage uh, kind of initial thinking in this very important future area from our participants. We are also going to hear from the team who worked on machine learning and particularly the impacts of transfer learning and its applications in the geospatial domain to address challenges related 
to everything from climate to emergency management. We are going to be hearing about this topic, I think, year on year going forward. We all are seeing the absolutely huge impact of AI and machine learning on all domains, and geospatial is no exception. So we're really looking forward to hearing about their innovations. We're going to hear from the group who have been working to develop geodata cubes. This is really part of our focus on the basic fundamental spatial technologies, what are the file formats that are going to support and the data structures that are going to support uh, future geospatial interoperable data. So we're looking forward to hearing from that group. We will tomorrow be hearing from presenters who have focused and contributed to work on analysis ready data, really having data sets that are ready to go, usable, critically trustworthy, reliable data sets so that we don't have to process everything from the beginning every time. Uh, this is absolutely critical, not only for being able to respond quickly to today's challenges, but also from a sustainability perspective, thinking about the costs, both uh, financial and environmental of cloud computing. So some really interesting, important work there. We're going to hear from the group working on agile reference architectures, again, thinking about the spatial data infrastructures and designs of the future. So we will hear about uh, the advances that they have made. And last but not least, tomorrow we will be hearing from a team working on geospatial high-performance computing. So really, again, looking at the spatial data infrastructures and systems of the future and how they can be supported both by cloud, which we know is increasingly important, and high-performance computing, really looking at these two platforms and how they work together. Now, you are going to be hearing about the work that was done in this test bed to make progress really through collaboration. We had a wonderful group of participating organizations, and you're going to be hearing from them over the next two days. You see their logos up on the screen. And I really want to emphasize that without them, the test beds would not be possible and would also not be the valuable, interesting, and fun initiatives that they are. So we are just so grateful to all of them. And to give you a sense of the scale of work that was done, we had 23 participants contributing to this test bed. We had six sponsors who, of course, we also have to express our gratitude to, to NASA, to the European Space Agency, to the iGUIDE Consortium, to Natural Resources Canada, to the NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and to DSTL who brought in resources and funding to enable the Testbed 19 to take place. And we brought together over a million of in-kind cost share offered from industry and academia. So this really was a very large team effort and allowed us to bring a lot of value to the table to support this work. And test beds here today we are hearing about test bed 19 but i think it's important that we situate them in the context of the overall innovation process so test beds build on previous test beds and build on previous pilots and hackathons and will feed future ones so everything that you're going to see today about what took place in test bed 19 has built on prior work in Testbed 13, looking at things like WPS type designs, so kind of a long standing trajectory of looking at different formats for data exchange, data interoperability, looking at continually improving that, eventually building testbed on testbed, iterative improvement, continuous innovation, moving into new and uh, emergent file formats, the beginning of OGC's work on APIs, and then feeding into thematic focused pilots, which then again feed into future test beds. So we really can see how everything that we were doing in test bed 19 has built on continuous effort over the years, and we can see the outcomes of this test bed really feeding into future work. 
So we are going to be seeing today the key deliverables from the test beds. We are going to be seeing a range of API specifications, particularly things like the GeoData Cube specification uh, draft coming out of this test bed, a extraterrestrial geotiff engineering report with some initial suggestions for that key new future format. We are going to be seeing another key outcome, proposals for a next generation agile reference architecture, again coming out in an engineering report from this test bed. We are going to be seeing proposals for things like learning as a service and a workflow for that coming out of the machine learning group reported in their engineering report. And we are going to be seeing things like recommendations for updates to the analysis ready data standard, again, in the ARD group engineering report. And we are going to be seeing proposals for workflows that connect OGC processes with high performance computing infrastructures, again, in their engineering reports. So I hope that you will all listen carefully and enjoy the presentations today, but I also really encourage you all to go and read those engineering reports and engage with the content that is being produced when they become available. So more formally to kick us off today, we are going to begin with some presentations on geospatial and space. So hearing from those participants, there will then be a short break from 10 to 10.15. We will then hear from the group of participants who contribute to work on machine learning, followed by another short break. And then last but certainly not least today, we will hear from the big pool of participants who contributed to the uh, Geodata Cube's work. So that is today's program. And then tomorrow we will hear from the remaining thematic task groups. And we encourage you really all to come back tomorrow and to join us again. And as you are listening to all of the wonderful outputs from Testbed 19, I encourage all of you to think about how you might get more involved if you hear something exciting, if you see a technology or a standard being proposed that is relevant to your organization, you might consider getting involved in our next test bed, test bed 20, which will be kicking off in 2024. So I encourage you, if you want to learn more about this, to follow the OGC on LinkedIn or Twitter. If you don't already, Twitter is now X, excuse me, so on at Open Geospatial. But but also to think about becoming a member if you want to engage further. Uh, some of you who are already members might consider sponsoring and driving forward a task in Testbed 20, or if you want to participate in Testbed 20, again, to follow us and to look for the call for participation, which will be coming out in the next few months. And we hope that you will enjoy today, learn a lot, uh, engage with what the participants of Testbed 19 have done and consider getting involved in Testbed 20. So with that, I am going to hand the mic uh, back over and we will move you into the first set of presentations. We're still waiting if you've seen the screen. Okay. Well, I'm Chuck. Uh, I'm Chuck Hazel. I've been uh, supporting uh, NGA. Presentations. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, Chuck. Yeah, I had a problem <laughs> with finding the unmute button. <laughs> do, you, do you have a lead in, or shall I take it? Uh, yeah. Uh, I I start, and then I will uh, leave it to you for Very just good. a second. Okay. Thank you, Chuck, for uh, stepping in while I was trying to figure out what's going on here. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, thank you again. Yeah, 
Uh, good day. Uh, my name is Sina Kagavikish, and I work as the COSI uh, Collaborative uh, Solutions and Innovation Project Manager at OGC. Uh, I'm also the architect for the Geospatial and Space Task. And as uh, Rachel already mentioned, Geospatial and Space is the continuation of the efforts it started with the previous test beds, uh, test bed 18, specifically 3D Plus. Uh, so our aim is to explore uh, some existing geospatial standards uh, to address basically deep space explorations, uh, but it actually could be used even at the scenarios that we have in the Earth. Uh, but in general, imagine a scenario where Earth is far, far away and space is really the final frontier. You don't have Earth to uh, start as a starting point. Uh, with, uh, with that, I uh, would like to thank, uh, thank our members uh, that, uh, and participants that in this order they're going to present uh, their results. And uh, yeah, uh, with that, I also want to thank, uh, thank our sponsor, uh, NGA, and Chuck, uh, if you would like to go ahead, I leave the floor to you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, for the record, I'm required to tell you that I am not an employee of NGA. I'm a support contractor. So anything I say does not constitute official policy or the position of NGA. It's a necessary uh, disclaimer. Uh, I'd like to uh, start by uh, thanking NGA for funding uh, this part of the test bed 19. Uh, and where this came from was a question that was asked oh, a couple years ago, actually, where NGA asked the OGC, can OGC standards be extended for use on the moon, Mars, and in deep space beyond? Uh, this was largely uh, motivated by the tremendous increase in activity in, uh, in space. You've got multiple uh, human habitats that are planned for the moon. Uh, EM wants to go to Mars and build a colony up there. We have uh, new satellites being launched almost daily, it seems. And space is getting crowded. And uh, a lot of people are looking at how we're going to manage the exploding population off outside of the planet Earth. So we first formally addressed this question in test bit 18. And the answer we got back was actually OGC standards are very well suited for going out and doing space or other planets, uh, but there are some adjustments that need to be made. And those adjustments are usually, mostly driven by three factors that we have in space that we don't have on the planet Earth. Uh, one is that distances are very, very, very long. If you, uh, there's nothing approaching the distances you routinely find in space on the planet Earth. The other is that velocities become very, very large. I mean, some things are actually traveling at the point that they have a significant percentage of the speed of light in their relative velocity, which brings in some rather squirrely mathematics you have to take into account. And then uh, finally, on the Earth, we tend to assume that we have a planet that everybody's standing on. That's kind of that's kind of our common datum. You really don't have that in space because of the size and because everything is moving relative to something else. You basically have a tremendous cloud of moving objects, each with its own reference system, and the measurements between them depends upon the relative velocity between those two objects and it gets much more complicated to do something as simple as measuring or stating what is the velocity of an object, what is the velocity of a feature. Uh, that's not as straightforward as saying what's the velocity of a car. It depends upon where it is, how fast it's moving relative to the object during the observation. So all of this has to get uh, grouped together and folded in. And it was seen to be totally beyond what OGC can do, but guess what? It's not that big a change. So the presentations, well, we found from test bed 18 that this did seem feasible. In test bed 19, we've actually built the prototypes, we've refined the uh, knowledge, we've written specific changes to existing standards that would be necessary to implement all this. 
and that we've used the prototypes to validate that our recommended changes should actually work. So what you're going to see in the uh, presentations coming up is a demonstration of the prototypes that have been developed and the problem space that they are each one's addressing. So with that, I'm going to get out of the way and let's get on to the important stuff, which is the demonstrations. Thank you, Sina. Thank you, Chuck. And uh, yeah, I forgot to thank Amanda as well. She was very helpful throughout this project. And uh, yeah, uh, I believe our next presenter, Mark uh, Martin has uh, Mi Michael has a bit of a technical difficulty. So until he gets back that into order, I will move into the next presenter, which will be Martin. So, Martin, where I can, are you there? Oh, uh, no mic. <laughs> I okay. think we're having difficulties with Martin as well. I can't unmute him. Um... Okay, maybe I will move to the next one until we figure out this. Okay. Uh, Steve, let's me unmute you. Where is it, Steve? Greg, you should, can you? Steve, yeah. you should be ready to speak. Too much audio difficulties. <laughs> I don't see. Okay, maybe we should move on again. I don't see. Okay, let's go to the next one. <laughs> Rob, I hope you won't have an audio problem. Hello, Sina. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear Fantastic. you. Right, uh, thank you. Um, do you have my slides? Yes. Yes. Right. Uh, so, um, I'm working to 10 minutes here. Uh, so, hello, uh, my name is Rob Smith from Away Team Software. Um, I'm a member of the Spatial Data on the Web Working Group, which is a joint committee between OGC for geospatial standards and W3C for web standards. On the OGC side, I'm involved with GeoPose and Moving Features. And on the um, web side, I'm leading development of Web Video Map Tracks, WebVMT, which is for um, an open format for uh, synchronizing location with video for the web. Um, next slide, please. So in Testbed 19, um, I've been exploring uh, video aggregation from multiple sensors for moving objects. And as uh, Rachel's already said, this builds on previous uh, testbed results from testbed 18, moving features and sensor, sensor integration, which has been uh, bundled into the uh, geospatial in space. The common theme here is synchronization, um, and particularly ag I'm interested in aggregation of data. So the use cases are very terrestrial for a, um, a space thread, um, but these were identified in a, a previous testbed, as I say, um, and they are to do with the, the road network. Uh, they're quite mundane, but imp important for public safety, and they're two sides of the same coin. So for wrong way vehicles, we're observing moving objects with multiple static cameras, and for litter monitoring, we're observing static objects with multiple moving cameras. So the wrong way traffic is the main focus uh, here in testbed 19. And the aim is to identify vehicles traveling against the flow of um, 
the, the road from traffic camera video. The litter monitoring use case, we've also gathered some data for, um, which is to identify geotagged roadside objects from a fleet of dash cam videos over a period of time. Both of these use cases require video with time geopose. Um, and so in April, we I was part of a collaboration um, to capture video and sensor data um, down at Ordnance Surveys headquarters, um, along with Steve Smith from Open Site Plan, um, with a variety of uh, uh, video devices. So in particular, the street drone vehicle, which is um, Ordnance Surveys, which is you see pictured here, which has front and rear um, cameras that we can run together, um, and roadside uh, cameras, which were smartphones on tripods, acting as static cameras um, with geopose that was captured using the 3D Compass app that was developed in Testbed 18 last year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we're aiming to demonstrate how Geopose can be integrated with WebVMT. Um, WebVMT has a, a, um, a capability to encapsulate a JSON format. So we used embedded um, basic Euler uh, Geopose for orientation. The WebVMT queues allow us to synchronize Geopose with video and WebVMT interpolation allows us to um, calculate continuous Geopose over time. Um, and secondly, we want to synchronize the video data set using um, Geopose. The data has been captured on board the, uh, the vehicle and by the roadside cameras, all of which are running separately. And we need to synchronize those accurately together in order to aggregate the data. And you can see in the photo here, um, the onboard trajectory is shown in orange of the street drone. The roadside tracking is shown in blue, that's the dark blue line. And then the sight line is the, the um, paler diagonal line, which shows the, the center of um, the, the camera view. Uh, this data set will be released publicly um, under an open source license. So uh, you'll be able to play with it yourself if you're interested. Next slide, please. So the key issues and challenges, how to track vehicles uh, from video. Um, we were able, able to use sight lines uh, in the video to identify a particular video frame uh, where the vehicle crosses that sight line and then match the location with time, um, sorry, the location and time um, against a, a detection zone, which again, you can see in the um, photo here. Um, so we can discriminate between the two lanes of the road. Um, and the accuracy depends on the range and video quality. Secondly, we had to synchronize data from multiple sources. And the mechanism we used here was if you have two observations of a moving object at the same location, that must be at the same time. So that's a synchronization point. Um, we developed a, a new WebVMT tool in Testbed 19, um, which calculates the closest approach of a trajectory to a location with millisecond accuracy, because we're able to interpolate in, in WebVMT. Um, and this enables us to synchronize the data uh, with accuracy metrics. So we, we can also gauge the performance, how well we're doing. And having synchronized it, we're then able to aggregate the data using WebVMT utilities from Testbed 17, so two years ago. Um, and finally, how do we determine the traffic flow direction? Well, this is very simple. Having uh, taken this approach, we can simply check the detection zone order for a particular vehicle. Um, ABC, it must be moving in this direction, which is very simple and robust. So next slide, please. How did we do? Just a second. All right. So this is how we did. Um, we were able to successfully synchronize the data using geotag video and with good accuracy. Um, we are getting within 100 milliseconds, so within a tenth of a second. The video is at uh, 30 frames a second, so one frame is uh, 33 milliseconds. We uh, enriched GeoPose data with WebVMT, synchronized it with video, 
integrated it with a web browser and, uh, and therefore HTML and interpolated GeoPose over time. We also prototyped some new features for, for WebVMT. I would say uh, WebVMT was published as a W3C group note last year in September, um, but because we're a joint committee, it also has an OGC document number, um, which may not be on your radar. So I would urge you to go and check that out. Uh, so the new features include uh, simplified data interpolation, which is consistent with the path interpolation scheme, uh, negative queue times, which sounds a bit counterintuitive, uh, for non-destructive synchronization. Um, things can happen before the start of the, uh, the video. Um, and heading, which is a, a, a lightweight version of GeoPose with incomplete data, which is something that GeoPose doesn't support. The unexpected result was that we were able to apply the same sightline techniques and analysis um, to footage uh, from a BBC program called Crash Detectives. Um, and if you want to check this out for yourself, please do. It's series four, episode one, um, where CCTV from a home security system was analyzed to um, estimate the speed of a vehicle um, about a kilometer away. So on a completely different scale to, to the problems we've been looking at here. But you can see a picture of how that analysis looks in the photo. This is an operational police use case um, for forensic vehicle speed analysis. Um, and we were able to get successful results for that too. And next slide, please. This, I'm painfully aware this is a very short presentation. So I've included this final slide uh, with some links for those who want more details about the things I've been talking about. But now I'm gonna share my screen and skip over to a, a demo um, to show you this uh, in action, assuming we have time. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, I just need to share my screen. Uh, do I have permission to do that? You should. I'm looking. Ah. Uh, Right, hopefully you can see my screen. So on the left, we have a web browser. This is Safari. And on the right, we've got some um, some files. So I'm just gonna pick up the VMT file and the video file, and drop them into the browser like that, and off we go. So here we are at um, Ordnance Survey's headquarters. Here's their headquarters building. Um, and the car park and the perimeter road, uh, which we're using as our test track. And down at the bottom here, hopefully you can see the geopose of the camera where we currently are. So in orange, uh, geopose being a location with orientation. So a location with a, a direction pointing out of it. So in orange, we have the geopose recorded by the 3D Compass app um, on, the, on the smartphone on the day and in blue a corrected version of this to give us better accuracy but you can see the results are the measured um, values are very close to uh, the, the genuine one um, next thing to do is to detect the, the passing vehicle so if i just drop that in there you can see the detection zones so we've got the, the main axis of the camera is the dark blue line and then some other sight lines are the pale blue lines and where those intersect the, the, the road lane, lanes, um, we have detection zones. Um, so if a vehicle passes or if an object passes uh, through that sight line in the video, then we know it's at one of those locations and we can geotag it. Um, so that allows us to track and there's the sight line, there's the street drone and there's us tracking that as it goes by. So it's all synchronized up with the video. We can now uh, synchronize that with the onboard data. So if I just drop that in, you see we're now riding with the street drone um, because it's going round the roundabout and coming back. Just turn the alignment on and I'll freeze it 
when it's in the middle of the frame when it comes back and you can see how accurately that is synchronized with the video so just about there well, slightly late but if i zoom in you can see the blue line is tracked from the the camera that we're looking at the orange line is the location tracked on board and the pale blue line is the sight line and that's all pretty accurate so i'll just run that on it tracks across for as long as we can see obviously we can't track it beyond our, our field of vision and i'll just show you very quickly um, data from another camera that was on the same run but at a different location i'll just skip forward it's about a minute or so in here you can see the orange line of the street drone coming around the corner and it'll appear in view in a sec once again i'll just freeze it in the center and show you how accurately this is synchronized so again we've got dark blue line is tracked from the camera the orange line is tracked on board very close right in the middle of the um, the sight line and continues to track on past thank you very much thank you rob for the presentation uh let me see uh okay let me turn back my slides uh can see my slides right let's check okay uh steve uh can you uh did you is your problem solved or the audio issue let's see i can't hear you uh steve Greg, is Steve here or? Yeah, his audio went off again. He's he. We'll try him one more time. Does, he does this uh, ritual test with the audio until it works for the go to meeting. So I don't know if it works with the go to webinar. Okay. Uh, how about you, Martin? Are, is your problem? Uh, can you talk or unmute him? I can't. Yeah. Okay, lots of audio issues. All right. Let me move to the uh, Jerome's video, I guess, until we Hello. try to figure Hello. Oh, Hello. okay. <laughs> Good to have you, Steve. <laughs> All right. So okay, so me. can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, so I just clicked around on a lot of things and uh, okay. So I actually went to sound check again and back and that seemed to have coincided with you hearing me. Okay, so I'm ready. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, you can go ahead. I think you can see your slides, right? I, I see the first one, yes. So next slide. So um, the GeoPose specific part of the work in Testbed 19 that we did had to do with not just what Chuck mentioned about um, seeing how things work in um, new coordinate systems, new combinations of coordinate systems, um, new uh, configurations of multiple moving things, observing each other um, and making um, estimates of uh, which things are which things. Um, one of the important parts of the work was simply to take results from testbed 18, which resulted in a lot of comments and suggestions 
um, and incorporate those in GFOs and try to determine how well those could be implemented without breaking backwards compatibility with the GFOs 1.0 standard. So one of the um, ways that we did this uh, was to build a data set and Rob mentioned the collection of the data back in April of 2023 um, using the perimeter road around the car park at the Ordnance Survey headquarters in Southampton, UK as a um, test area. And in addition, we wanted to capture a collection of data that could be used to rehearse a scenario um, that had come up in um, another uh, standards form, Metaverse um, standards form, actually, uh, which is the um, process by which uh, if you um, ask for a ride hailing service to find you a car and bring the car and you together as a rider uh, to take you somewhere, how that rendezvous works. So um, a lot of the way the capture of data was structured was to support this, this rendezvous um, emulation. It's not really a simulation, it's a real thing. Now, if you think about it in another way, we have um, the car that you saw in Rob's presentation, uh, we had people walking around with body-mounted cameras. We had a drone flying around in the air. These are all different moving things that are observing other moving things that are possibly observing them. And the relationship between the coordinate systems and the reference frames is actually analogous to what you find if you had a spacecraft whose positions reference to um, different coordinate reference systems, which may be based on um, observations of the location of very distant um, celestial bodies, for example. Uh, there's often a chain or a, really a graph of relationships between uh, locations and coordinate systems. So the big part of what we wanted to do was to just see if the geopos as it existed in with these extensions would work under extreme conditions. Next slide, please. So um, on the right, you see the bubble. It's roughly a kilometer in diameter. Um, we um, looked at um, the um, entire area of the bubble is one where we control um, all of the, the geometry and physics. Now, one of the ways of taking this observation of multiple things moving in different directions, um, observing each other uh, at the same time and apply it to the great distances and high speeds that Chuck referenced, um, was to use slow light. So uh, we tried this using normal light speed and then as well uh, where light was slowed to about 1% of its uh, 300 million meters per second normal speed. Now, Sina, I noticed this is like, a, this is a different version of the slide than the last one I had. Um, it doesn't have the link to the uh, video. I, I played a video. Don't worry about it. Do you want me to play the video? Okay. So um, please play the video now. Okay. Can you see the video? Uh, screen sharing. Yes, you can. Yes. Okay. This is a composite of the video streams from six imagers used in the Hillyfields data capture 
on the 26th of April 2023 in the vicinity of the headquarters building of the UK National Mapping Agency, the Ordnance Survey near Southampton, UK. Each imager is identified with its name and frames are posted with a time of seconds from the start of the experimental run of the Ordnance Survey street drone. The street drone is a small white and blue car taking the role of a ride-sharing vehicle being requested by one of two persons, called in this instance Rider 3 and Rider 4. Rider 3 and Rider 4 have chest-mounted video cameras, and Rider 3 also is carrying a handheld mobile phone. The street drone is equipped with eight cameras, but only the front and rear cameras were used in these runs. A DJI Mavic 2 Pro drone flew above the street drone, observing it and the two riders from a height of about 30 meters during the two runs shown here. These are runs 7 and 8. The video streams were sent through image segmentation and object detection processing pipelines. Detected streams of classes, person, car, truck, bicycle, mobile, and quadcopter were further processed to give a time series of geoposes for each object in each stream. One interesting feature of the data capture is that each of the imagers observed multiple other imagers as they were all in motion. An important goal that is the subject of ongoing work is to automatically identify objects viewed by multiple sensors. You'll note the uh, location of uh, detected objects in those classes by a crosshair surrounded by a bounding ellipse. Okay, uh, next slide. So, um, our goal was to see how well GFOs worked in uh, more extreme combinations of uh, coordinate reference systems and motion. Uh, we did this in a way that made it possible to support proof of concept or prototype that would show um, a real world use case, not in space, the right hailing rendezvous. Next slide. Um, so we, we found that uh, the extensions work well for building pose graphs. In other words, these relationships between the different reference frames of different objects in motion um, in both Euclidean and non-Euclidean spaces. Uh, the, as Rob noted, the captured data is, is reusable. We hope that uh, we can use it uh, to develop and test algorithms and, and that um, the algorithms can be uh, compared in terms of performance and capability by running them on the same data sets for comparison purposes. Uh, finally, the extensions that were tested in TestFed 19 will feed into the GeoPose Standards Working Group uh, as part of the discussion on how GeoPose might be um, extended and improved um, in 2024 and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for the presentation. Uh, I now share the video from Ichere, from Jerome. Uh, so let me play this video since we are short on time. Okay. 
For OGC Testbed 19, Geospatial and Space, Acheri and other participants explored the use of standards and tools for referencing non-terrestrial objects. For our main deliverable, we provided a Moving Features JSON component consisting of a tool to encode trajectories following that standard, a sample output for objects of the DART scenario, as well as a visualization of that scenario using our Gnosis Software Development Kit. Participants selected the Double Asteroid Redirect Test, DART, mission as a scenario to experiment with geospatial referencing, tracking, and visualization of non-terrestrial objects in space. DART was a NASA mission designed to demonstrate asteroid deflection using kinetic impact. The spacecraft traveled from Earth to impact Dimorphos, a natural satellite of the near-Earth asteroid Didymos. An additional feature included in the scenario was Lichia Cube, a miniaturized satellite sent to capture images about the effect of the impact. Source data for the scenario was configured and retrieved from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory Horizon System for the four scenario objects, the DART spacecraft, Didymos, Dimorphos, and Lichia Cube. To perform coordinate conversion experiments, the data was retrieved in four different coordinate reference systems all based on the International Celestial Reference Frame, but with different origins. The Solar System Center of Mass, corresponding to the Barycentric Celestial Reference System, the Earth Center, corresponding to the Geocentric Celestial Reference System, the Bear Center of Combined Dimorphos Didymo System, and the DART Impactor spacecraft. Moving Features JSON is a GeoJSON encoding extension for OGC Moving Features allowing to encode changing geometry over time, as well as dynamic properties. We developed a tool to convert the data retrieved from the GPL Horizon system to Moving Features JSON. The trajectories of the DART scenario objects were encoded as line string features, including a date times property with the time value corresponding to each point of the trajectory. Although the date time values should be in UTC, for the purpose of the experiment, the time values generated are in the source barycentric dynamic time, TDB. Additional temporal properties preserved from the source dataset included the velocities, as well as the difference between the TDB and universal time temporal's reference systems. Universal time is kept within 0.9 second of coordinated universal time through the use of leap seconds. We developed a visualization of the DART scenario based on our Gnosis SDK, building on previous work from Testbed 18. GLTF 3D models, available from NASA, were used to represent the scenario objects. The Gaia sky in color from the European Space Agency was used for the background stars, which should be oriented correctly relative to the other objects. The visualization used the Moving Features JSON representation combining all four DART scenario objects in the BCRS. The BCRS provides a single consistent frame of reference minimizing the effects of general relativity for observations within our solar system. The reference plane of the BCRS is the celestial equator whereas its primary direction is the March equinox. In these experiments, BCRS coordinates are expressed in 3D Cartesian form with units in kilometers, though they could also be expressed as spherical coordinates. As with previous Testbed 18 experiments, the visualization also made use of the NOVAS library for obtaining positions of planets of the solar system at any given time and for converting between Earth-centered, Earth-fixed coordinates and inertial coordinates. In this demonstration, we improved interpolation between the 5-minute steps of the trajectories by implementing cubic interpolation. We also prototyped a potential alternative representation of the same DART scenario data as sequences of geoposes stored within a top-level features property of a JSON object. In this prototype, the Geopose 1.0 Basic Quaternion Permissive JSON Schema is further relaxed to allow the use of x, y, and z coordinates instead of the lat long h coordinates. The valid time property used in Geopose 1.0 stream elements is also used to provide the temporal aspect. A CRS element is also included at the top level shared by all features. Each pose is additionally extended with a set of temporal properties for their value associated with that pose. 
This prototype could potentially be considered together with the NeoPose efforts for future GeoPose developments. It would also be useful to further clarify the relationship between GeoPose, Moving Features JSON, OGC API Moving Features, and OGC API Connected Systems, which all define different mechanisms to encode the positions and orientations of moving features. In conclusion, these geospatial and space efforts provided an opportunity to further test OGC standards to reference non-terrestrial objects and provide input for future revisions. The usefulness of celestial reference systems for tracking objects in free flight was demonstrated, highlighting the need to register definitions for these celestial reference systems defined by the IAU in addition to those for planetary CRSs. Additional experiments are ongoing to test integration between the Gnosis DART visualization demonstration and the Apache SIS library to perform conversions through the standardized OGC Geo API. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. I'm not too sure if you are able to speak. Uh, Martin, is your uh, audio back? We kind of have only three, four minutes. Now maybe I open the floor for questions. Uh, mute all. Hello, uh, Hello. can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, so can you put the slide, please? Sure, uh, we'll do. Just give me a second. Good to hear that you're here, Martin. <laughs> It's uh okay, here we go. There you go. Okay, thank you very much. So part of the test bed for this test bed was to test the existing OGC OGC and ISO standard, in particular ISO one nine one one one. So in the in the test bed last year we make some uh, a discussion about uh, the feasibility to use ISO 19111. This year, we did an actual prototype, and we also made actual change request that the uh, working group can adopt if they wish. Can we go to the next, next slide, please? So uh, some key points to keep in mind. First of all, ISO 19111 is the abstract model behind the APST database so if we look at the table structure, it follow closely the ISO 19111 model. GML is uh, almost uh, one by one match of ISO 19111 for the referencing part. While no text too, and also software like Apache SIS and Proj. So Proj sent ver version six. The internal of Proj is uh, a very close match of ISO 19111. So this data structure actually uh, has a big importance in the geospatial at this time. It's used by many important data format and also used by software, by uh, the most advanced software doing uh, coordinate transformation stuff, in at least the most important open source one. It's not well known that ISO 19111 provides also a coordinate operation framework. So when we talk about ISO 19111, we often think about coordinate reference system, but ISO 19111 is not only a framework for defining CRS, it's also a framework for training CRS together in a chain of coordinate operation. This part is not well known, maybe because uh, uh, the well known text format provides only a partial uh, support of this part. Uh, the only format that supports the uh, coordinate operation extensively is GML and EPSG uh, for the data structure. And GML is not as popular as when no text 2 as a, a format for CRS stuff. If we look at what we need to change in ISO 19111 for making possible to apply that in space, there is not so much change to apply actually. And all the change are in the definition of CRS. We have not identified any change that are needed in the coordinate operation framework. It seems to be possible to apply as is. Only the CRS stuff need a little bit of uh, change. 
And the most important one are in this uh, slide. So we need to add an inertial CRS for uh, a body with X that have a direction that fixed relative to star, a Minkowski coordinate system for uh, special, special relativity, okay. and also a celestial body for the identification of the body for being able to say that this is the datum of Mars or this is the datum of Jupiter and things like that. Uh, the UML is in the is in the engineering report. So next slide, please. Uh, what we provide is this engineering report. We have made some drafts of ISO 19111 change request and also change request for well-known text format that uh, are ready for submission to the working group. So the working group can take those drafts if they want and adapt or modify it as they want. There is also change request for GeoTIF for being able to encode an engineering coordinate reference system for a GeoTIF image. So Michael is going to talk more about this part, but this is what makes possible to use GeoTIF for an image from a spacecraft, uh, the dark scenario, for example. Dark scenario was the video that we saw just before. For the GML, uh, it's possible to use GML in space with some small extension. So the blue box that we saw in the slide just before, we have made an XML schema for that. We have took a prefix that we, we use GSP as a prefix. Uh, the schema could be adopted as a UGC standard if the relevant uh, working group accept it. So with this extension, it's possible to use GML for the description of CRS in space and coordinate operation. So we also provide an example of operation method uh, for uh, doing a coordinate transformation in space using the trajectory of a spacecraft as uh, described by a moving CHO file. So the engineering report gives more details about that and an executable demo. The demo is uh, quite important in this test bed in order to make sure that what we are proposing work. So we, it's not just uh, proposal. We already tested that and tried that uh, in an executable demo. Another reason why the demo is important is because the change requests that we are proposing are just the most important stuff. When we try to do a demo all the way, there is small details that we found that are it's not clear if it should be part of a standard or not. Uh, there is some uh, space for interpretation. So the engineering report uh, talk about them in the demo section. So for now, uh, we uh, took some decision in an implementation specific way. And there are small details, but there are details important that we cannot make a full demo without, without that, without those decisions. Whether it should be part of a standard or not is uh, open to discussion. So the report uh, talk about that. The demo is doing a coordinate transformation from Dimorphos to Solar System Very Center to DART. So this part is described in D001. And it is chained with the D002 engineering report, which is about GeoTIF. So the demo continues going to make the connection with the CRS, which is defined in the GeoTIF, up to pixel coordinate. Uh, the demo is not visual. I am not showing it in this uh, slide. It's just numbers, so it's not very uh, uh, sexy thing to show uh, on the screen. And uh, it's not fully complete. I still have a few issues to resolve, but it should be resolved soon. Uh, next slide, please. A few observations. I said before that uh, ISO 19111 uh, can provide a uh, coordinate operation framework. Actually, the cooperation uh, operation framework provided by ISO 19111 is quite rich. What we see on the slide are some class from uh, ISO 19111. It's titled in the box are uh, a class defined by ISO 19111 standard. So we see that they provide all the data structure that we need for saying that uh, a an operation is made of many steps. So this is concatenated operation. It's possible to say that the first step operate on the three first coordinate and let the fourth coordinate time just pass through. 
And the second step is doing the opposite. It operates on the time coordinate and let the first three coordinates just pass through. And there is also this distinction between conversion and transformation, which is important for understanding where an error may be, where stochastic error may be in a, a chain of operation. So when I say stochastic error, I mean error not caused by software bug or uh, floating point accuracy, but error caused by uh, the limitation of uh, real world measurement the fact that we are using a curve fitting, for example, stuff like that. So in this chain of operation that we can describe with ISO 19111, in this case, the error may attain in the box in red. So uh, a user can uh, analyze a chain of operation and see where the stochastic error may be. And they may also, if they want, choose another chain of operation. We may have many uh, between the two same CRS. Next slide, please. So as I said before, uh, one issue with the coordinate operation in uh, using the ISO 19111 model is that the only data format that is powerful enough for expressing all the aspects that we need is GML. So when no text uh, is good for some, uh, some operation, but it's not as complete as GML. Uh, GML can be very complex if we have a big, huge GML file. One way to make GML much easier to, uh, uh, to read is to split a big file in many smaller files and use reference to that. So this is what uh, this slide is doing. So it is uh, defining different steps of cross-net operation. But instead of defining all the steps inside a big file, it's making reference to other GML files where um, more individual steps are defined. So it's possible to split a big definition in many files, defining each step, defining CRS, and things like that. It makes GML much easier to read. But uh, for being able to do that, we need to uh, the capability to make reference to other files. So this is explaining href. And this is one of the things that is missing in well text uh, right now. We don't have any, something equivalent to uh, explain href in well known text. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, ISO 19111 can be used uh, with very few extensions for the CRS part and ACs for the coordinate operation part. We have change requests ready for submission. We have a demo showing that it can work. And uh, the GeoPose can be described, a GeoPose operation can be described in ISO 19111, except for the orientation part, which is something uh, more specific to GeoPose. So ISO 19111 is all about the transformation of position. GeoPose also addresses the transformation of orientation. So this thing is not covered by ISO 19111. But except for the part, a uh, geopost transformation chain can be expressed in ISO 19111, which is good because it makes possible to use that with existing software like Prush or uh, uh, Apache CIS if we do the conversion path, path from geopost to ISO 19111. Uh, ISO 19111 can do more things also. As I said, it's a, it's a very rich cross-net uh, operation framework. However, GML is not a popular the encoding format for coordinate operation. So that may be uh, something that uh, reduces the adoption of ISO 19111. And GeoPose can be a, an alternative way to encode uh, trend of operation using a different approach. OK, that's all. Okay, uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, we have only maybe five minutes for a few questions. If yeah, I did not see any questions on the uh, question section, but you can drop them in or you can speak now if you have any questions. Otherwise, uh, Greg, I think we can take a maybe five-minute break. 
to start yeah. the, the next I think session. that'd be great. Let's do let's start at 15 minutes after the hour, so about four minutes, uh, and we'll try and keep that one uh, on track as well. So thank you okay. very much. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll just restart in about five, four minutes. Thanks.
Hello, everyone. Uh, you can hear me well, right? Yes. OK. Yeah, uh, uh, let's continue on the, the second uh, session for today, uh, which is the machine learning transfer learning for geospatial applications. Uh, the original architect of this thread was Trent uh, Tinker. He actually moved away from OGC, so I took over. Uh, I am Sino Tagavikesh, and uh, with that, let's actually uh, give the floor to Jim. I, uh, oh, actually, before that, yeah. Uh, once again, I want to thank uh, thank again all the participants of uh, this uh, this task, uh, Sats and GMU, GeoLabs, Rendered AI, and Pixelatics. And they will present their presentations in this order. And without any further notice, I would also like to thank NGA once again, and uh, uh, Amanda and also Jim uh, for helping out with this uh, task. And without you, it would have been really hard. And uh, Jim, uh, if you are unmuted, I leave the floor to you. Uh, great, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Excellent. Excellent. All right, you'll all be hearing about some very interesting uh, uh, work here uh, that I've had the pleasure to uh, be associated with. Uh, this is the machine learning thread in Testbed 19, and specifically, it's about transfer learning. Uh, I'm Jim Antonis. I'm a somewhat grizzled vet of uh, computer vision, AI, machine learning, and 3D. Uh, and I've been supporting Amanda Morgan, who is the government lead for NGA's sponsorship of this work. Um, can I have the next slide? So NGA is the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Uh, as many of you know, it's uh, interest in, uh, so the question is, why would we be interested in transfer learning? Um, well, the NGA mission is to know the world, show the way from seabed to space. And that includes uh, many diverse applications, uh, of course, defense and intelligence, but also disaster relief, for, uh, support for first responders, um, and uh, many diverse uh, services, mapping, safety of navigation, uh, positioning of navigation and timing, uh, a lot of stuff. Um, but knowing the world means acquiring what's not yet known what's known imprecisely or known incorrectly. Um, so what we're seeing is the emergence of these new suite of tools, machine learning, that's now addressing those issues uh, increasingly well, really, extremely well, really. Uh, next slide, please. So what, oh good, the, 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 I'll be able to do the click through. Hold on for a second. Uh, so yeah, what I'd like to do is draw a quick picture of, um, machine learning, but specifically about the transfer learning aspect of this. So if you uh, you see this, we've got a uh, this uh, rendering of a, um, a, a domain problem. I've got a bunch of domain inputs, and my problem is to figure out in those domain inputs, let's say it's an image or it's some it's sound, uh, some, some uh, a time series or uh, sound record or something. And in there, I need to pick out something specific, an image I'm looking for, maybe some kind of waterway or a bridge or something. All right. So the classes are the things I'm looking for. The inputs are, you know, imagery usually in our area. The next uh, click, please. And uh, what we do in machine learning, and particularly in the the the, um, the version of machine learning that's emerged over the past decade or so, the neural net stuff, is we apply uh, this uh, neural architecture, it could be any kind of computational architecture, to, to extract features from those original inputs that might be indicators of those classes. Um, next. And from those features, we're going to go and say, well, what, what combination of these features actually tell us that it's this element of the class versus that element of the class, right? So I just want to stop for a second. This is the basic, you know, uh, a picture of one kind of machine learning. Again, there's many, many kinds, but this notion of going from a set of inputs that may be unstructured uh, through a, a feature extraction piece, that's been new over the past decade or so, or, or really come to the fore in the past decade. And that has been extraordinarily effective to, to sort of figure out what these features might be. And my, my apologies, features here are 
computer vision features or, or analysis features. They're not capital F features as in OGC, which are named things. These are the finer grained elements that might be indicators. Um, and getting these right is extremely hard and very expensive. Uh, this has been what, what we do is we stack many, many of these layers in order to figure out what these features are. And we regress, we regress our, our you know, good and bad examples back through that network to the, the inputs to figure out what the, what, how those features should work with each other. Next. And so what, what we're looking here is, is a variant of this called transfer learning. Um, uh, next, please. And in transfer learning, the basic idea is, well, we have some other application, right? We have some other set of inputs. We're trying to figure out what classes, you know, are we, how do we find the classes in those other inputs? Um, and so uh, what we do is we, you know, we kind of look around and say, hey, do we have an existing uh, solution that might apply, right? So if we're looking at, uh, if we're trying to figure out how to distinguish Volkswagens from, from Toyotas, from Fords, uh, it may be that we have something out there that distinguishes, um, you know, pickup trucks from uh, from uh, minivans, right? Oh, that might re be relevant. Maybe the features there might apply. Uh, and so we have this notion that, oh, we'll find this uh, this other application that already exists. Um, next slide, please. Next, um, next click. And so the big deal is that we, we say, hey, we may be able to reuse all this work we did, all those those features that were so expensive to uh, to extract, we may be able to actually uh, reuse those. Uh, and if we use those, reuse those, if we access the previous um, solution, uh, bring them in in this interoperable environment where we have sort of we can uh, use the same uh, underlying capability, reuse it, and go to the next slide, please. And, and then with maybe a different combination of those features. Uh, maybe some slightly, you know, refined features of the starting from those features would actually give us good performance in these new classes. And indeed, that's worked great over the past decade or so. It's revolutionized things. It's really been the heart of of how uh, these techniques have sort of, you know, had such an impact in our our environment. Next, please. Yeah. So so transfer learning is all about transferring those features from one application to another. Next. And uh, and with that, we've we actually have done a bunch of work in, with these groups with the with the uh, the presentations you'll see, and the results have been that uh, when we think about this in the context of standards and and, and particularly the fair principles, uh, the fair principles and standards are findability, accessibility, interoperability, and usability. Um, and if we take those in reverse order, uh, what we've seen in this, and you'll you'll hear talked about, is that we, we've demonstrated reusability. Um, We've we've demonstrated an exercise interoperability, and we've actually uh, been able to bring over and access existing models and implement and execute that. So we've demonstrated that also. But that findability piece is is one where it's still pretty open. We we knew about some previous exi existing applications that might be useful, but how to do that in general is still an open question. It, it seems uh, it seems to us and. And there's this follow-on, which is the fair principles are all about uh, these these basic ways of making systems interact. But there's a different sense of fairness, which is equitability that's emerging now uh, in large, um, you know, a, a big turn towards trustworthy AI. And I just was suggest that as um, you know, as possible next steps, uh, what we'll be seeing in the standards community is an effort to make this AI not just fair in terms of in, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, but also fair in terms of reducing bias. And we can see that coming in the future. And uh, with that, uh, please, let's turn to the people who are doing the, the real work here. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for a great introduction. Now I leave the floor to Satsan. OK. Chola, uh, are you muted or can you speak? Hello, can you can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can okay. hear you really well. Perfect. Um, well, uh, we presented uh, some considerations about the um, re 
research questions for the testbed. If you can pass to next slide, please. As I said, we presented feedback on the research questions and we wanted to leverage our, our experience with machine learning models uh, to see and present some requirements and necessities uh, for a possible standard for models. Uh, so we can, all the community can benefit from standardized models, not only for transfer learning, but for uh, model sharing in a more broader sense. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as the research questions focus on the FAIR principles, we follow it in our feedback. So to make models more findable, we need uh, to have a set of metadata that includes a name, a version, a brief description of the model and uh, a link to the training data so that uh, uh, a model is always connecting to the data it was trained on and uh, a user can know what trained the model. Um, to make the models accessible, we believe that uh, there should be not only access controls and the way to share the model, but also um, a description of how the models can be used. And in some cases, a system to serve them to possible users. And all of these can be standardized in the way that uh, sharing is made possible. Uh, we believe that the interoperability and reuse of the of the models are linked together, and uh, exchange formats as, such as Honix and uh, making model model serving independent of the fr their framework is a important step in the in the way to uh, standardize model sharing. Um, of course, this uh, feedback we provided is more is presented in more detail in the engineering report, but uh, this was just to give you a, a brief summary of our opinions and our feedback on the issue. And uh, next slide, please. And just some brief conclusions as well, that uh, there are many use cases for transfer, model, uh, transfer learning and model sharing. Uh, we took a bit uh, the transfer learning part in a more broader sense as people might be interested in using uh, previous trained models, not only for uh, transfer learning, but for other applications. And um, um, the, these use cases have been uh, worked on in the, during the testbed by the other participants. And we are happy with uh, the way that the testbed evolved. And uh, we believe that uh, there's a necessity to continue this work and to further standardize model sharing and serving practices. And um, we are uh, confident that standards like the training DML AI for training data can be extended for models. And uh, this is a good way, a good starting point to further standardize models uh, for transfer learning and for other applications that use them. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's move on to the next presentation. This is the George Mason University. I will be playing the video in a second. Uh, if you bear with me for a second. Here we go. And Hello everyone, this is Chen Zhang from GMU. Thanks for joining our Testbed 19 demonstration and outreach. Today I'm going to demonstrate the topic of machine learning, transfer learning for geospatial applications. And our demonstration mainly focuses on testing the transferability of machine learning models between geographical locations. First, we explored the feasibility of transfer learning in crop type mapping between the different geographical locations. And second, we implemented the transfer learning model to the use case of in-season crop type classification using the Earth observation data. And third, 
we evaluated the fire principles for the transfer learning model. And our deliverables can, uh, include the transfer learning algorithm and the test data set. And the transfer learning algorithm is basically the code for the implementation of the um, crop type classification machine learning algorithm. And the test data set will consist of Earth observation data for the model training and output the crop cover maps as the reference data and the ground truth data for the result validation. And this deliverable will enable researchers and scientists to reproduce and validate the transferability of the machine learning model in other Earth observation applications. And our technical approach consists of several key steps, uh, including the data preparation, the model training, the transferring to the different locations, uh, reusing pre-trained weights and parameters of the model, uh, and the result evaluation and comparison. And here is the process of the training data pr preparation. Uh, we developed a machine learning model to automatically learn crop rotation patterns and generate training data from the historical crop type maps. And in this case, we used the cropland data layer, uh, which is produced by the USDA uh, as the reference data. And then we train the machine learning model using the Earth observation data such as the Landsat data and the Sentinel-2 data and then transfer the model to the um, other geographical locations for the uh, in-season crop type classification. And the results based on our transfer learning model sometimes um, contain the misclassified pixels. To refine the mapping results, um, we applied the um, state-of-the-art computer vision technologies such as the um, segment anything model to remove the noisy pixels within each cropland field. And here are some preliminary results and you will see the difference before and after the um, image enhancement. Here is a brief summary of our findings in this test band 19. And first, by combining transfer learning with Earth observation data, the crop type map can be produced for the area without ground truth, which is valuable for agricultural and food security decision making. And second, the in season crop type maps can be used for the early estimation of crop yield in the other green exporters. And uh, early estimation data can provide timely decision support and guidance for farming, especially for those countries with um, different growing seasons. And third, although this project specifically deals with crop mapping, the transferable machine learning strategy investigated in this project could be potentially applicable to transfer learning issues in the other domains. So that's pretty much my um, presentation for today and thanks everyone for your attention. Thank you, Chan. Uh, let's... Uh... Let me share my screen again. Okay. Uh, I could not find Rajat yet, so let's move to uh, Dan's video. Uh, I, Rajat's, Rajat's on, but he, he can only speak. Let's go ahead and... He him. can speak? Uh, if... Unmute him, let's see. Rajat, go yes, ahead. I can speak. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. I'm having a horrible internet today. So 
Uh, I'm going to present uh, learning as a service framework, which we developed as an AI powered framework based on OGC API processes and OGC training data markup language, which came out uh, uh, recently as a standard. And uh, the team members are Gerald and Adrian from Geolabs. We all are working on this uh, testbed 19 ML activity. Uh, Sina, can you please go to the next slide? Yeah, so as overview has been mentioned and uh, Chen also gave a very nice presentation. So our objectives were looking from the software perspective and understanding the software stack from the OGC existing standards. So the first objective was to develop a learning as a service framework. We are just calling it as learning as a service, meaning like all the ML components where uh, the plan was to implement all the ML components like training, inferencing, fine tuning as a part of a web service. And to also understand the interoperability of various deep learning frameworks, we have uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and uh, many other frameworks. So the idea was how the weight is being shared when we use models uh, developed in one framework and then pass it on for fine tuning with another framework. Uh, please, uh, next slide. Yeah. So the motivation is to develop a baseline for standardized workflow, implementing various aspects of a machine learning workflow. And the idea is to use existing OGC standards and how we can standardize the workflow. And also to analyze the requirements and challenges in bringing the existing implementation to the OGC standards, uh, closer to the OGC standards. So if we go on to the next slide, please. Yeah, so in this one, we can see a usual workflow, which starts from training a, any deep learning based model, replacing the last layer and then fine tuning it using the pre-trained weights and then fine tuning it for your own particular application. And uh, Sina, if you can please uh, click twice. Yeah, one more time. Okay, thank you. So yeah, th this is the usual workflow, which is conventionally used in implementing or training a machine learning model and then uh, as I mentioned, freezing the layers, improving the model way of fine tuning. So the task here is to, can we implement this entire workflow as a web-based service based on OGC web processing service standard or OGC processes API, and also try to incorporate the recently published the training DML standard for data representation. Uh, the idea will be to use this workflow for uh, directly using an, any automated data set which is being published in an automated fashion. So we have stack or other specification which directly publishes data in an automated workflow and can we use that for uh, implementing this. Uh, maybe next slide please. So yeah, coming to the deliverables, we try to standardize the workflow. So this entire illustration shows the deliverables from our side. So we have two Docker images, one hosts the inferencing server and another one would be hosting the client which would interact with that uh, server where the entire architecture is placed. So in that, every user would be having a capability to implement whatever task they want and that task would be authenticated using the OIDC Connect and they would be having their own data set. This data set can be converted to the TDML standard uh, format uh, using TDML as a service. So we are calling it TDML as a service. And then that particular data set can be passed on to different models. So all the models will be available as a model zoo or model catalog. And a particular user can use that model or uh, the future capability is that they can even host their own model and use that with the existing data set for training or inferencing or fine tuning. And finally, uh, to in, in this aspect, we also implemented the capability to visualize a particular model. So given a model file, how can you visualize the layers and try to understand if uh, the layer flow is correct or not? And then finally, there is an inference as a service which can use that existing model and use it for inferencing. So uh, with, the, with respect to standards, we have used OGC API processes for uh, implementing all these web-based services and also ONNX, which is Open Neural Network Exchange format for implementing the uh, machine learning or deep learning models. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so as I mentioned, like these are the things which were deliverables in this uh, out of this testbed activity for us. So OIDC based authentication for individual users because security is an important aspect 
with respect to machine learning workflow for a particular team or particular body so they would be having their own authenticated profiles inferencing as a service tdml as a service for converting existing data directory to a tdml format and then preview for visualizing the model layers uh, next slide please yeah so these are some illustration of the deliverables this this image particularly shows tdml as a service of how we can execute if we have a data directory how we can generate a json file uh, based on the training data markup language standard and uh, next slide please yeah and, and in this one we can see preview as a service so here we have uh, used netron which is an open source tool for visualizing models so if you upload or deploy any model uh, file we can directly visualize the layers and how the data is being flowed flown how the data flows from initial layers to the final output oh next slide please yes so from our perspective what are the future directions so future directions are to implement individual components uh, sequentially as a chaining operation based on OGC API processes part 3 and also to incorporate the part 2 which is deploy and deploy and replace so with that what will happen is a particular user can implement their own machine learning model deploy it and then undeploy it whenever they want as a web service then also incorporate uh, training using the training DML generated file right now we are just showing a capability how we can convert an existing data directory to a training DML format. We are not showing the capability of how it can be trained. So that is a future direction for us. And obviously connected with the other capabilities like GeoDataQ and HPGC API because all these deep learning activities, they do require HPC uh, support at the back end for training. Not, not exactly for inferencing or fine tuning, but for training it does require. So how we can connect these uh, deliverables with the other two uh, other two test 19 activities so that could be a good future direction and also with respect to this so we are thankful to uh, all, all the components all the all the members who are part of this and it would be great to see how we can incorporate our web services for their work uh, in their uh, implementations uh, next slide please yeah, so this is a, just an example scenario of how the UML diagram will look like. So there is a client which will interact with the server and I will not go into the details. I recommend all of you to read to the engineering report and uh, with respect to time. So uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, yes, yeah, so these are some summary and recommendations from our side, which we noted from the experience. ONNX definitely serves as a good interoperable format for saving pre-trained models and the way it's useful across any MLDL software framework. TDML is a great approach for converting existing data directory to a JSON file which can be used. And then of course, when we, if we are capable of implementing all these in a singular workflow uh, based on chaining operations, then we can automate a lot of machine learning workflows uh, which directly feeds in data coming from a data curation or data acquisition source and a machine learning pipeline is running on it to implement inferences in real time and that's it from our side we thank you all for your attention thank you Rajat uh, I will move to the next uh, presentation which is a video by rendered AI mm. Hello, my name is Dan Hedges, Lead Solution Architect at Rendered AI, and in this video, I'll describe the work that was done by Rendered AI with assistance from our partners at Orbital Insight to quantify the impact that synthetic data can have in geospatial applications of transfer learning, specifically in the context of rare object detection. Transfer learning is an approach to AI model training where the backbone of a pre-existing model is reused to enhance model performance for a different but related AI task. The use of transfer learning techniques is especially impactful for scenarios where there is not enough real training data to achieve sufficient performance. 
While transfer learning is typically done using a model backbone trained on generic data, our hypothesis for this project is that using synthetic data that is tailored to match the domain of the target data set will provide higher model performance over a generic approach. The objectives of this project were to, one, to design synthetic data to, that emulates a real target data set to test our hypothesis. Two, in the process of doing that, uh, determine the best practices for synthetic data generation in transfer learning applications. And from there, to better understand the factors that will influence synthetic data's effectiveness in transfer learning, as well as the general limitations of this approach. In our approach, we uh, the first task was identifying an appropriate test data set. For this, we landed on cargo planes in the XView dataset. Due to their relatively large size and abundance in the XView dataset, ensuring that uh, there was a sufficient level of detectability to uh, kind of baseline against. Next, we customized the existing RGB satellite synthetic data channel on the rendered AI platform to enable the generation of data to match our specific domain uh, and tested various approaches to synthetic data generation and their effects on the performance of a zero-shot detector trained exclusively on synthetic data. Finally, we compared the use of transfer learning techniques against a generic model, model backbone trained on the COCO dataset versus a backbone trained on our synthetic data to test our main hypothesis. In the rendered AI platform, we were able to experiment with several different approaches to synthetic data generation and compare their effectiveness in model training. First, we compared using standard unmodified cargo planes with those whose color, scale, and shadow were varied to provide more diversity in the, the data set. Next, we studied the impact of using GAN-based domain adaptation as a post-processing step to match the domain of the real XView data more closely. Through the various permutations of these data generation techniques, what we found was that the unmodified cargo planes, meaning those that, that whose scale and color shadow were not modified, uh, with the domain adaptation, the GAN-based uh, domain adaptation applied, provided the best performance. Next, we use transfer learning to train a cargo plane detection model using a generic backbone trained on the Common Objects in Context, or COCO, dataset. We then experimented with constraining the number of input images from the full set of 63 down to just five images to understand the impact of uh, fewer training examples. This brought the AP50 score of the trained model from uh, a high of 62% with the full data set down to just over 50% with the five uh, image training examples. Finally, we used the same technique against a model backbone trained on our synthetic data and compared the results of the two approaches. While we found an increase in performance in all instances when using synthetic data, this improvement was especially apparent in cases of highly constrained real data, with the data sets of 5 and 10 real images showing between a 10 and 15% increase in AP50 scores, matching the performance of scenarios with as much as five times the number of real images uh, when trained against a generic model backbone. So in summary, our experiments showed that a number of things. One, that uh, the performance of synthetic data can be improved by using GAN-based domain ad adaptation techniques. Additionally, we showed that, uh, especially in scenarios where real data is particularly scarce in those sort of rare object detection uh, scenarios, transfer learning with synthetic data can improve performance significantly over uh, using a generic model backbone for, trans, uh, for transfer learning. The implication for the broader spatial, geospatial community 
is that synthetic data can provide a significant benefit in transfer learning initiatives surrounding rare object detection. Thank you for your participation. We at Rendered AI are honored to take part in this year's Testbed 19 initiatives and are looking forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Dan, for the presentation. Uh, we have the questions towards the end. And if you have any questions, please put them in the questions box. And now we move to Sam. Sam, floor is yours. Can you hear us? <laughs> Sam, yes, I can hear you. Ah, great. <laughs> that was just, you never quite know when you do this. Okay, so I'm, I'm the uh, final speaker today. Um, and so I'm also going to focus on testing the applicability of transfer learning using existing models applied to Earth observation data. Next slide. So the, the role of Pixelytics was twofold in this SPED 19 activity. As has been presented by the other participants, we also undertook technical activities in terms of model testing. And similarly to GMU, we were also looking at the Meta Artificial Intelligence Segment Anything model. But we were looking at it in terms of its applicability to hyperspectral Earth observation data. So first of all, running it on a three-band RGB quick look, and then trying it with full hyperspectral inputs. The other activity was using a neural network that we trained ourselves to detect plastic waste, and seeing if transfer learning could help in terms of going from a, a generic example and training data set for waste to a specific scenario of agricultural plastic waste between greenhouses. And the aim here was to achieve higher accuracy when the model is trained and run on a specific plastic type versus the more generic training data set that it was originally built using. And our, our second role was to be the, the lead editor for the engineering report. Um, and I'm not going to present that today because we have very little time. And you will have seen most of the content from everything that's been presented by the whole group today. But I would certainly encourage you to, once it's published, to, to read it and peruse everything in greater detail. Next slide, please. So in terms of the, the meta AI model, um, what I took as an input was a, a Chris Prober 1 image. And this is over a test site called Barracks, which is in southern Spain. And it's an agricultural site used for satellite validation and algorithm testing. And you can see from the quick look on the left that it's a very complex area with lots of different shaped fields and they will have different spectral signatures according to whether they're bare ground or there's crops growing within them and i'm showing here the the three tests we we performed so the top test is where we've applied the segment anything model to the three band quick look and what we take as the output is the features, which are the polygons. And I should say they are randomly colored. And you can see that it works pretty well without any knowledge of satellite imagery. And you can see it's finding quite a lot of polygons. And it's certainly, we've noticed um, it becoming very popular overall in the remote sense community because it can be used straight out the box. But I was then thinking, we're losing all the other information in the hyperspectral imagery. So I next tried principal components analysis. So this is where we take the, the full spectral band set, but we 
extract the principal components and we use the first three of those as the input instead of red, green and blue. And that also worked, um, but I ended up with quite a similar set of fields being detected. So it didn't seem to particularly improve the scenario. And so my third approach was to go back to running it on three bands at a time, but run it 39 times. And so, in effect, incrementally move through the, the spectrum. And I tried this in, in different ways. Um, and in this particular example, I've kept the spread of the original three RGB bands, but shifted that through the spectrum. So it ended up running the segment anything model 39 times. Um, and it certainly detected more of the fields, um, and it's a bit difficult to see in a, a 2D view because I'm stacking all the features because I merge them each time it, it runs. But it was certainly a whole lot slower because it had to be run 39 times. And so really the next stage, which we, we didn't get to, would be to really go into the details of the model and, and see if I can change the input layer um, so that I don't have to run the model in such a intensive way to get the output. Next slide. So the other test was using our neural network model that we we previously developed in other research activities. So the Sentinel-2 image is a, a pseudo color composite showing the southern Spain area of Almira, where you have lots of plastic greenhouses. And the color composite shows the greenhouses, particularly in sort of white and gray. Sometimes they have a slightly green tinge because you can see the plant through them. And then the, the surrounding land is primarily shades of brown because you're in quite a dry environment. The neural network model on the right, top right, is when it's run after its full training and it shows you all the classes that it um, produces an output. So every single pixel in the, the image it's provided, and it, it can run anywhere in the globe, will produce an output and it will decide what land cover class that is, of which the, the red um, and purple ones are different types of plastic. The difficulty we had was for the people who were interested in that, they didn't really want to know about the greenhouses, but they wanted to know about the plastic in between the greenhouses, because this doesn't get cleared up and tends to wash into the Mediterranean, and then you start getting marine plastics and the issues that cause. So the image on the bottom uh, left, got to get this right, is it now being run with a minimized training data set using transfer learning. So I've stripped the input layer from the, the model and I'm now providing it a new training data set and I'm allowing it to change the, the input training and produce a different classification as the output. So we don't get the greenhouses now classified because that's not in the training data set. And there are a few an anomalies in there because I have a much more limited training data set, but actually the areas where it's detecting plastic do show up better. There's a, a very small triangle, and I don't think I've got a pointer, that is actually solar panels. So one of the disadvantages of this, this model is it will detect plastics for reasons other than what you would necessarily call waste. And the three images at the bottom just show a, a zoomed in location. So the little squares, at, black squares at the corner of every greenhouse is a, a water pond and that has a black plastic liner. So that will tends to show up as plastic or water, depending on how full of water there. But at the top, you can see the complexity of the output. And that is part of the difficulty of that, this, this model is interpreting that, that complexity. Next slide. So, Transfer learning was implemented and, and tested for two scenarios. And this was very, very helpful for me because I've not applied transfer learning before. Um, so the, the segment anything model applied to hyperspectral data 
um, in effect, I chose a, a trade-off for adding complexity versus completeness. Um, and that's available in an open GitHub repository if anyone else wants to play with it um, and see if they can improve the result. The plastic example was much more complex. Um, and certainly there is still more improvements that are needed in that model, but that in part um, reflects the difficulty of detecting plastic in the environment and the, the signatures you get. But we are certainly getting promising results from applying transfer learning. And so that's something I will work with going forward, where people are interested in me running the existing model in specific scenarios. So overall, in terms of applying transfer learning and reusing models, um, one of the conclusions uh, and recommendations we, we reached was that it is useful for OGC to coordinate the use of standard support interoperability among and between models and to define and agree a minimum set of metadata. And within the testbed 19 activity, we've certainly started to look into that. And as was mentioned, I think, by one of the other participants, the training DML AI group who have already published a standard on training data sets are now looking at models as well. Because we need to have as much metadata as possible, not only for the training data, but for the models and for the systems that they are run to have the transparency that Jim mentioned. And so I think this is a, an area of great interest um, and OGC certainly has a, a role to play to make sure wherever possible, we can reuse existing tools and knowledge um, rather than reinventing the wheel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you all uh, of the participants for the presentations of the machine learning transfer learning. Is there any questions? I open the floor to everybody if there's any questions. Otherwise, we can uh, maybe reconvene in 15 minutes. Uh, any questions? Okay, I see now. Okay. So let's, we'll start at quarter after the hour for the next session. And uh, those of you who are uh, participants for the Geodata Cubes, we'll go ahead and bring you up as well.
Okay, we'll be getting started in a couple more minutes. Thank you. Josh, you should be good to go now. I am. We are ready for the three ring circus, which is due data cubes. Shall we get going? All right. So welcome to the last segment of today's part of the Testbed 19 demo days. I'm Josh Lieberman, who's the task architect and cat herder for this and a, an associated task on analysis-ready data. It has a close affinity to the work we'll describe on GeoData Cubes today, but that segment will actually take place tomorrow morning uh, at 9.15. So I hope that you'll stick around for the uh, many fascinating presentations in this segment and also join us tomorrow morning for that. So what are geodata cubes? Well, it's uh, on a very you know conceptual mathematical basis. It's an orthogonal hypercube uh, which incorporates uh, geospatial uh, coordinate reference systems and phenomena of interest in Earth observation. Uh, practically, it's a way of organizing what we can know and see about the Earth so that we can pull parts of it out in a coherent fashion. So we can say, well, I'm interested in this one area of the world, but I want to look at it over time. And the main thing is that it's happening over multiple observations. So it's a way of organizing what we know about the Earth so that we can analyze it more easily. So, uh, and that gives us these three parts of the GeodataCube interface where we try to make GeodataCube 
structures easier to use by providing an easy way that gives you most of the ways that you'd like to access, work with, and uh, derive knowledge from a geodata cube. So that includes knowing something about the where the data came from, being able to access the data structure itself and say, you know, I want this time period, I want this region, I want to know about, you know, infrared light, uh, the different parts and dimensions of this overwhelming hypercube, but in a way that makes it easy for many clients and platforms and systems to make use of it for many use cases. So that interoperability, of course, is the uh, primary goal of this innovation work in the testbed to define the metadata model and the API, a candidate that uh, can be used by the standards working group, which is developing a standard for GDCs and APIs, uh, reference implementations that help people to understand how they can interoperate and test the API against a use, set of use cases. So there are multiple views, uh, particularly given a history of work on this. So uh, there were a wonderful uh, mass of participants in this segment uh, producing services so that implemented this candidate uh, GDC API and particularly built it from pieces or building blocks of other uh, OGC APIs, which are in process or already approved as standards. Uh, then there were a number who pre created visual clients, created data analysis clients, and then did some analysis uh, evaluation of the API in terms of uh, conformance, uh, in terms of ability to uh, fulfill, to um, follow some of these use cases that uh, the sponsors are interested in. And speaking of which, I should thank particularly ESA and uh, Natural Resources Canada for supporting this uh, dive into the unknown. So there has been previous work uh, in Testbed 17 and an architecture for this API framework was proposed uh, and tested, implemented, and uh, we looked at you know what makes sense in this you know common API and what are more complex and uh, better suited to more specific platforms. Uh, and then of course this has been translated into a charter for a standards working group. These are the marching orders to produce a new standard, uh, and that identifies real use cases and maximizes the consistency between the Judata Cube API and the other APIs, as well as the common API common uh, pieces that uh, we hope will be part of every OGC API. So uh, we have three use cases. The one from uh, NRCAN is, is pretty straightforward, uh, looking at open source reference, looking at being able to access and subset a Judata Cube and process the content, both for analytical purposes and to increase, maximize the convenience of the output of the response from a GDC API. Uh, use cases from UMETSAT and ECMWF um, uh, quite a bit more involved. So uh, with a lot of these, there's the question is, um, should these capabilities such as non-rectangular subspaces be included in a common API? Does it make the API more capable, but does it make it too complex? And so there's a lot of back and forth based on both uh, coming up with these um, capabilities, implementing them and evaluating them. So uh, just a quick look to see that the GDC really is this aggregate of different pieces of APIs, particularly API coverages, the basic GDC structure, API processes, what you can do with the, that content, and API records so that you can evaluate, is this suitable for my purposes based on where the data come, came from? And uh, we did also uncover 
uh, complexities in different ways to produce and execute workflows. Essentially, uh, GDC is a combination of the concept of a coverage or spatial field, spatial temporal field, and workflows that can be performed to that data and from that data. So with that said, I would like to turn things over very quickly to the participants themselves. And here is the order of presentations. We have first a presentation from Alex Jacob on the API candidate specification and the engineering report. And then we'll go through uh, presentations of the implementers of both clients, uh, clients, clients and servers or servers. Uh, and then finally, we'll look at a couple of these evaluation processes from 52 North and Synergize. So um, stay tuned, this is going to be fun. So I'll turn things over to Alex. Great. Are you able to unmute? Yeah. Yes, I, I just got the green light. <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, thanks for the introduction also to give everyone a little bit of background here. So uh, this is now a quick overview of the draft API so that you can understand a little bit later when you see the implementations of the different service and clients, what they have implemented against because the first task before we implemented anything was actually to come up with some kind of draft spec that we can work against. So we can go to the next slide here. Of course, uh, this development has not uh, come in, an, uh, in a vacuum of space. There are a lot of things ongoing in OGC, but also outside. So we started with having a, a look in where we are. Josh already mentioned previous test beds. There's, of course, everything going on in the OGC API suite of uh, standards and working groups. There's also things outside of uh, OGC, like uh, technologies like Stack, the Spatial Temporal Asset Catalog, and also OpenEO, which are all relevant uh, uh, technologies uh, here and then the first exercise that we did was actually looking into how they compare what they offer and also where they potentially disagree in a number of these crosswalks which which are the links here the slides are on the portal later in case you want to have a closer look there um, then we can go to the next slide uh, this led to some kind of mapping on and what's going on in the OGC API framework and uh, where are things already aligned here specifically for the example of OpenEO and OGC API modules with OpenEO, uh, which is something we have been working on for many years already. We've always looked at what's going in an OGC and the OpenEO API spec is actually closely following many parts of the um, API modules already. So all the green modules, basically OpenEO and OGC API already aligned. There's some differences in, in data processing and these are also the things that we started to want to experiment with here in, the, in this um, test bed to see how these things actually work and which uh, archetype of spec might suit the Geodata Cube better or worse. Uh, um, you will see that in the current uh, draft, we couldn't really make a decision yet. So that's something that remains for the standard working group to make right now. It's possible to express things in both ways. Uh, then we can go to the next uh, slide. Um, here, uh, the, the discussion uh, of the um, Geodata Cube API proposal has been started with this uh, uh, testbed, basically. There's the issue that initiated this, and the first uh, draft spec is attached uh, to this issue as well. Um, again, for those of you who are observers or following this, you can, you're can you invited to have a look into this discussion and also contribute there. We will soon also then get started again with the standard uh, group's regular meeting so that we have a continued uh, discussion on, on this. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, the first uh, specification that we built was uh, actually kind of a fusion of what we did in OpenEO and what's available in, in, in this OGC API suit of standards for various of the parts. Uh, you can see on the very top level, the endpoints, they should look very familiar to those of you who have already implemented parts of OGC um, API, but also of, of OpenEO. Um, and uh, there's a lot of good overlap there already. Sometimes this might also be a kind of false friends because there might be same endpoints, but they do different <laughs> things. So this are, these are exactly the critical points that we try to figure out with these crosswalks that I mentioned 
earlier uh, and where we still have to find some good solutions, especially on the part of uh, data processing. Um, this is now a first framework that we have that, that we can have a look at and, and continue the discussion on. Again, this is really just a, a draft uh, spec and not the final version. So no one needs to be afraid that this is already decided. The testbed just gave us the possibility to implement all of these, get some experience, how they feel, how they work, what's good, what is bad. And from here, we can then, together with the report that is uh, currently in, in writing, the engineering report, we can then continue the discussion there. Okay, next slide. In general, uh, one click please. Uh, in general, uh, the, the API has been set up in a very modular way. Uh, the first part is the discovery layers. This is basically just information about the service uh, as also familiar in, in OGC API. So we have uh, server capabilities, service discovery under the conformance and the root slash. Then we have data discovery under the collections endpoint. We have process discovery uh, and possibly also what kind of output file formats you have. Uh, under this endpoint and finally authentication this allows you to understand if a service allows for authenticated and authorization access and in which kind of authentication methods there are available then next click please the next layer is the, the um, processing and uh, data layer basically so the most simple pro uh, level of processing is just accessing the data by by slightly reducing the size subsetting it filtering it in a little uh, bit there we are mostly following the the coverages spec so that's the clear data access then we have two different uh, processing ways of doing processing right now one following the open your spec and one the the ogc api processes part one uh, basically, which you'll find then also here. That makes uh, right now the development of client a little bit more complex because uh, they need to sort out based on how these endpoints are offered, what uh, what kind of processing they can send here. Next. Um, and finally, in the end, there's the result access and the visualization layer, basically, so you can um, based on how you do your processing, visualize your results directly again using other uh, web services like uh, the new maps and tiles or also and following the open your part, uh, traditional W asterisk S kind of pseudo standards, WMS, WCS and so on. Uh, and uh, or simply just downloading or, or getting a list of all of your results that you can then download through the uh, resources. One more click. Uh, here you can then see for each of the boxes, they're rendered a bit strange here, but nevertheless, uh, where uh, these things have been specified and where this uh, part of the spec came from. Uh, we, we really try to not invent a completely new definition of anything here. Uh, that's also very important. We really try to make this a, a kind of profile based on what is existing and, and, uh, and bake that in here. So in these boxes below, you can really see always where we have taken the information come and, and where they already align. You can also see here, sometimes it's with an and, which means they are already aligned and sometimes with an or, it means yeah, that's one or the other that needs to be implemented uh, there basically. Then we can go to the next slide. Based on this modular design, this allows also service providers to, to offer a very simple service or a more complex one. So the most simple is just, I have some data and you can access that. Then you just need to implement some very few of these blocks. Uh, what you can do, of course, capabilities, data discovery, and just the data access module, but no advanced data processing module, which makes this kind of just sharing data service a very uh, relatively simple implementation. Then next slide. Uh, you can also do more complex things and allow any kind of processing in here, uh, be it through OpenEO and consuming uh, the results dynamically through a web service, like in this example. Next click. 
uh, in, in this part, you can also include, of course, an authentication if you want to. And the same goes also for when you do processing through the OGC API processes uh, and then you download your results again. This, of course, means that a lot more of the modular features have to be implemented. And in general, in, when you go towards the more advanced data processing, there's more work on the backend provided to implement all of this. But this shouldn't come as a surprise anyways. Important is that we also, during the test, but have developed open source solutions that are accessible, which you can also build on, as you will see later in the presentation. Next. You can go one more to the next slide. Exactly. Here you can see, for example, a first interoperability metrics for one of the clients, the uh, uh, new web editor, uh, where we already looked into all the different backend implementations uh, and see what, what is uh, possible to be done here. This is a, um, in during the demonstrations, you will see how we also use this client, for example, to connect to different backends to really show that the spec is also working across different implementations uh, following both the OpenEO and the OGC API specs. Uh, so that this part at least has, has been a success during the test, but and we are quite happy about that. Next slide. And finally, again, just a reminder that here is the engineering report that's still work in progress, so that's not finished yet. Uh, I hope that in the next week or so we can wrap this up so that we can then provide you also with the insights that we have gained during this exercise. From my side, just thanks to all of you who have contributed to this so far, and uh, it has been really fun, this exercise, a lot of hard work and a lot of long and, uh, needed discussions on all of this, and that probably now during this week, this discussions will continue. Geodata Cubes is a very hot topic with a lot of people uh, working on it already. So the standardization is really needed here. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this continued process. Um, that was the very first introduction. Thanks from my side. And now we go to Jerome and Desir, I guess. Thank you very much, Alex. Yeah. And so it's really great to show how this is a both, a, you know, an independent effort and so embedded in the work of so many other groups and people. So uh, particularly the connection with OpenEO, uh, which is also um, uh, something that OGC is becoming involved with as uh, considered uh, community. Uh, exactly, right. That, you, that yeah. you remind me on this. This yeah. is actually what I forgot. We have during the time of the test, but submitted both Stack and OpenEO actually as proposals for community mm -hmm. standards. So anyone who would like to wrestle with some of these harmonization issues, OGC is at the moment the place to do it. So, so with that, let's look at uh, some of the work that's been done by the participants here. Uh, I don't, Jerome, do you want to say a word? If I don't just here? Please, please show the video. Thanks. Okay. I will do that. I will turn off my camera. Noah. Tuck videos at Cherry. Let's watch the right one here. For testbed nineteen, the Cherry contributed to the development of a draft GeoData Cube API standard. We provided server and client implementations for the API as deliverables based on our Gnosis Map Server and Gnosis Software Development Kit. We implemented the subset of GDC capabilities based on OGC API coverages and OGC API processes, but not including the capabilities based on OpenEO. Our vision for the GDC API is based on profiling existing capabilities defined by other OGC approved and draft standards. A core profile could define the minimal capabilities to conform to the GDC API, including the ability to retrieve specific fields from a geodata cube for a given area, time, and resolution of interest. This corresponds to the OGC API coverages part one core subsetting, scaling, and field selection requirement classes. A processing profile could define the capability to provide a custom execution request to execute a workflow integrating predefined processes and data available from the API or from any other GDC APIs 
while remaining flexible as to the content of that execution request. This would correspond to the core and OGC process description of OGC API processes part one core, as well as to the collection input, remote collection, and collection output requirement classes of processes part three. A CQL2 profile could support CQL2 expressions to define filters and derived fields directly as part of data requests without necessarily implementing the processing profile, but implying support for field modifiers when combined with the processing profile. As we will demonstrate, CQL2 expressions provide a very intuitive and compact way to express simple arithmetic calculations such as vegetation indices, as well as slightly more complex use cases a separate GDC profile could potentially be defined for the different OpenEO capability based on proposed OpenEO OGC community standard, which differs in some aspects from OGC API processes. We provided a GDC API server instance that supports the OGC API coverages and processes capabilities. The coverages capabilities includes the core, subsetting, scaling, field selection, as well as coverage tiles. The processes capabilities include the core and OGC process description. The API also supports additional capabilities that we proposed for inclusion in GDC API profiles, including requirement classes defined in the draft processes part three workflows and chaining extension, such as collection input, remote collection, collection output, nested processes, and field modifiers. The implementation also supports capabilities proposed for an OGC API coverages part two extension, enabling filtering and deriving fields using CQLT expressions, which we demonstrate later in this video. The implementation supports additional OGC API standards that integrate with the GDC API, such as OGC API DGGS and OGC API maps. Several data cubes were made available from the GDC API deployment covering the range of use cases, including climate and weather data sets, static environmental data, as well as remote sensing image time series data. We improved our Gnosis Cartographer software, a desktop 3D visualization client, as well as the underlying Gnosis library to better interpret with the different participants API endpoints to retrieve and process GDC data. Acheri performed technology integration experiments with the implementations available from all other participants. Here we demonstrate visualizing a tree cover density data cube available from the Razman GDC API implementation. Here we demonstrate visualizing CMIP5 data for wind velocity retrieved from the Copernicus data store. In addition to the spatial and temporal dimension, this data cube includes an atmospheric pressure dimension. The client supports changing the pressure level for which slice of the atmosphere to visualize. Here we demonstrate visualizing ERA-5 relative humidity data. This data set also includes an atmospheric pressure dimension with a finer granularity of pressure levels. The spatial and temporal resolution is also higher, whereas only a small subset for six days was loaded onto the server. To provide an easier and objective way to continuously test different server implementations and report tie success, we developed a command line GDC API test application. The test reports a passed, failed, or skipped result for each of the supported GDC API capabilities. These supported capabilities are core landing page and collections for OGC API common, core subsetting, scaling, field selection, and tiles for OGC API coverages, core OGC process description for OGC API processes part one, collection input, collection output, and nested processes for OGC API processes part three, as well as SQL2 filtering and SQL2 derived fields for planned OGC API coverages part two. We believe this GDC test will prove to be very useful for server implementers to test their implementations, facilitating successful ties with different clients. The tool supports several options to select testing with a specific collection, temporal interval, spatial region, or fields. The test both retrieves data as raw coverage, as well as attempts to render it by applying a style and generate an output which can be kept for further manual validation. A planned OGC API coverages part two extension could define the ability to filter or derive fields using CQL2 expressions. In this example use of the filtering and derived fields extension, 
that GeoTIFF coverage is returned from the Gnosis GDC API implementation for the average near surface air temperature and converts it from Kelvin to Celsius and filters out cells where the difference between maximum and minimum is not greater than 10 degrees. In this other example, the coverage is returned from the Sentinel-2 filtering out cloudy data using the scene classification layer field and computing an enhanced vegetation index from the near-infrared, red, and blue bands. A requirement class of Part 2 could also enable joins with other collections, including feature collections, facilitating the integration of vector and raster data. The fields from the joined collections would become available for use within the filter and derived field expressions. An additional example use of the filtering extension would cover different types of queries supported by OGC API ADR use cases, such as trajectories, by using CQL2 S intersect spatial relation function together with the WKT geometry such as a line string. Only the data cube cells matching the function would be returned. This extension could also define standardized functions allowing to perform aggregation along one or more dimensions using specific aggregating operations such as minimum or average. Another standardized function could allow performing convolution where operations on cell kernels allow to easily implement advanced capabilities such as edge detections. This example prototypes defining a Sobel operator used in such use cases. These additional capabilities would likely address a large majority of processing use cases using a very intuitive syntax that can be readily combined with the other building blocks defined in OGC API coverages that may also be selected for the GDC API core profile. In conclusion, we look forward to continue contributing to the GDC API development and improve our Gnosis implementation with additional capabilities as further thought out during this testbed. We are particularly interested in implementing support for aggregation, convolution, and spatial joins with geometries and between different collections. I think that finished. All right. All right, I'm going to go to, I hope, where is that not the one? Where is mine? So odd. Okay. Well, there we go. Okay. So we're going to uh, move on to uh, feel free. To... We can't unfortunately hear you. So we'll go right into the video here as soon as it queues up. Sorry, Josh, are you looking for camp yourself? You're breaking up for me there. I couldn't couldn't pick out what you were saying. Same for me there. Yeah, just the, uh, go ahead and I'll play the video here. Okay, so uh CompuSalt had uh three deliverables in this test bed. One was to provide an instance of a geodata cube. So in the video that it's about to play, you'll see uh use of the ceasefire data cube that we created the GDC API instance against. Uh, you'll also see use of our catalog where we took our catalog services for the web EBRIM data model, but put a OGC API records interface in front of it. And you'll also see the visualiz visualization client, the third deliverable that we had. 
where as an end user, you will be able to access these uh, geodata queue processes and coverages to perform analysis to, uh, in the case of this video, it's showing a fire potential risk index. So yeah, just go ahead there, Josh. Thanks, Jason. This video shows the utilization of CompuSalt's Web Enterprise Suite in support of the OGC Testbed 19. Focusing on the creation, cataloging and visualization of geodata cubes. To aid in data discovery, we added support for OGC API record services in our CSW catalog. There is currently only one OGC API record service in our catalog. Let's publish another service. We created an OGC API process service to allow users to easily publish into our CSW catalog, portfolios, and meta manager. To add a service, simply open the West catalog process by selecting the gear icon. Select the publish process option and select next. We made a new OGC API record service for CCAN records, so let's publish that. Enter in the service URL for CCAN and select the service type, in this case OGC API, and select next and finish. Let's now look under the OGC API records category for our newly published service. Let's view the metadata about this service by selecting the open full metadata icon. Select the capabilities URL link to open the service in a browser. Select the HTML option. This is an OGC API record service that we made to improve discoverability of CCAN services around the globe. Here you can view multiple collections. Let's preview some WMS layers. The combination of our West catalog for publishing and discovery of services, paired with our new OGC API record service, improve data discovery and interoperability. The testbed involves implementing a workflow to combine multiple fire risk indicators, such as normalized difference vegetation index, NDVI, soil moisture, relative humidity, wind speed, temperature, etc., into a fire potential indicator over an area of interest. This result can be visualized as a OGC API coverage. Using CompuSalt's Web Enterprise Suite, workflows are managed by creating an associated West portfolio. West portfolios provide the ability to manage, organize and track information and content associated with incidents and events an organization is supporting. In this case a portfolio was created based around Fish Lake National Forest Wildfire that occurred in Utah in 2023. Our scenario will show the progression of a fire potential index, FPI, leading up to the fire that first started on August 4, 2023. This will be done by running the OGC API processing service to show the FPI at different intervals, prior to the fire. We will begin by drawing an area of interest over Utah. This chosen area will serve as the focal point to run the processing service. Notably, the bounding box coordinates have been pre-populated for your convenience. Next, we will input a date that predates the occurrence of the fire. The fire potential index, FPI, is then displayed on the map as an OGC API coverage. The risk levels are visually represented in a gradient from low to high, employing the color styles of blue, white, and red. Areas of no risk are omitted. We've repeated this process using multiple dates to illustrate the incremental escalation of risk leading up to the occurrence of the fire. More results were added for analysis and data visualization. In addition to visualization of the FPI-related coverages and processes, the workflow will include data over the area showing things such as road networks, structures, fire perimeters, and containment zones. The fire perimeters and containment zones were created using our Go Mobile product and OGC Geo packages. Within WES, various sources are harvested for analysis and predictive modeling, including OGC APIs, features, coverages, processes, and records.
the data used in generating the processes, was the SEAS Fire Cube, a global dataset for seasonal fire modeling in the Earth system, containing 21 years of data from 2001 to 2021, in an 8 days time resolution, and 0.25 degrees grid resolution. A diverse range of seasonal fire drivers, atmospheric and climatological variables, vegetation and socioeconomic variables and other target variables, such as burned areas, fire radiative power, and wildfire-related CO2 emissions. CompuSalt started with this and created harvesters to keep the data up to date. We then used OGC API coverages and processes to create a means of visualizing the data. OGC API coverages provide a global view of the data, with a temporal capability to allow users to see the changes over time, for any particular variable involved in the fire potential index calculations. OGC API processes provided the framework to allow us to create a workflow where users can obtain the fire potential index over any area of the earth at any past or present time. In conclusion, through OGC Testbed 19, we developed a fire potential index that transforms analysis-ready data, ADR, from a ceasefire data cube into decision-ready data. This data is then visualized using OGC API coverages, contributing to more effective disaster response and decision-making processes. Thank you for viewing this video showing the utilization of CompuSalt's Web Enterprise Suite in support of the OGC Testbed 19. Focusing on creation, cataloging, and visualization of geodata cubes. Thanks, Jason. And that uh, was CompuSalt's contribution. We're going to turn now to uh, Gio Matisse. Uh, Quentin, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yes, I'm here. But I think you can start directly the video. I will do so. Thank you. Hello, my name is Quentin Vialuta and I work at Geomatis. In this presentation, I'm going to present our work on our database client based on Unreal Engine as part of the Testbed 19 Geodata Cube section. So here is the architecture of our client. On the right is the client and on the left the servers. So to display the 3D terrain in Unreal, we use a Geomatis server to stream the terrain using quantized mesh which is then used by Cesium for Unreal to display the Earth in our Unreal scene. For the rest of the data, we use the OGC Geodata Cubes APIs exposed by the various participant servers. For each, we can execute several types of queries such as authentication, collections, coverages, and map tiles. And all the data is then processed according to its type in the client for display. So let's take a look at the demonstration for a few visuals. The first thing I'm going to show is how we use the map tiles API to display data on the ground. So for example, I can request fire data. So the window contains all the information about the data cube and the query system on the right. Here I'm just going to click on map tiles. So you have the fire data display. So for your information, the small window on the left shows the list of data cubes exposed by the participants. I can also um, request other data such as black marble. So here is the black marble. I can also show blue marble, for example. So that's it for the blue marble. Um, and the second feature we implemented is the Courage APIs. So for the moment, our system can only display weather data at different altitudes and with a unique temporal value. So for example, I will request ECMWF temperature data. So I can choose a spatial extent. Then uh, we find the data contained in the data cube. So I'm going to select the temperature field. Below, these are the different axes. So I'm going to choose the size of my spatial axis lat long. For the time, I will keep the current date and for the pressure, which will be used as altitude, I will select just a few values. And finally, in this geodata cube, there are two time components. And as I said earlier, for the moment, we can only manage one time value per request. So then I click and now uh, I'm going to create a display service for temperature, which will manage the query and the data display. So I can send the request and as you can see, the data is there. 
so you can change pressure to see different slices of the data cube requested. So next, I will show you uh, how we manage humidity data. So as before, I'm going to request ECMWF data from Rasdaman here. So I'm choosing an extent. And here I'm going to use a scale factor for my axis. Then I'm going to choose the first value proposed for time, for the time axis. And I keep selected all the pressure values. So then I create a new service. So a service for humidity data. And I can launch the request. So for the display, we create clouds based on humidity. So you can change the pressure to see humidity at different altitudes. So you can see clouds uh, over the, the map uh, according to the humidity. Um, and then I'm going to run the same request again, but with a different date to show the difference. So even if we can, can't um, have multiple dates per query, we can have several displays of the same data cubes and with a different temporal values. So as you can see, the data is different, even if it's the same data cube and the same altitude. The last thing I'm going to show for this demo is the display of wind data. So I search for wind data. Again, I'm going to choose an extent and a scale factor. So here I'm going to slice a time value and keep all the pressures. Then I click on request coverage. I can create a new display service for wind and send request. So you can see the wind with different colors corresponding to the speed. Once again, you can change pressure to see different altitudes. So I can also select several pressures at the same time to display a larger area of the data cube requested. That's it for this short demonstration. To summarize, even if there are still some limitations on the temporal aspect, we successfully implemented part of the GDC API in our client. So even if we weren't able to implement all parts of this API, this work has resulted in a client that can interact with data cubes via the GDC API. So thank you for watching and listening. Thanks, Quentin. Uh, that was terrific. We'll turn now to Blockman Consult. Our main representative was Pontus Lokok. Uh, but we will turn to their video here. Hello. This presentation covers Brockman Consult's contribution to the Testbed 19 activity. First, I'll introduce our Xcube framework and describe how we implemented our Testbed 19 components within it. Then I'll describe how we deployed these components for an integrated demo and move on to the demo itself. Xcube is our existing software framework within which we've created our GDC server, client, and viewer implementations. Xcube adds GeoData Cube features to the Python scientific stack and is often de deployed as an API server or as part of a notebook environment. Amongst other things, Xcube has a Python API, a command line interface, and an interactive viewer. Our GDC server and client are implemented as discrete plugins within Xcube's modular architecture. These are the capabilities of the GDC API we've implemented in the testbed. We support the data discovery and coverages sections, as well as some stack endpoints. Xcube has a homegrown compute API, which we hope to adapt into a standard processing API in future. 
Our testbed deliverables, like all of Xcube, are open source software and will remain in the public Xcube code base. We implemented the GDC API server as a plugin for the Xcube web API server and the client as a data store plugin. These both use internal APIs to talk to the core Xcube system, which acts as an interchange between data protocols and formats. Our viewer implementation uses an Xcube server instance to connect the client plugin to our interactive web viewer. Here we see how our GDC components fit into the Xcube framework. The parts added for the testbed are highlighted in red. At the core is an Xcube server process, which interfaces both with data stores and with server API plugins. The API client at bottom left interfaces with external GDC servers using the GDC API, making their data part of the server's data pool. On the other side at the top left, the GDC server plugin can access data from any of the data store backends, S3 buckets, Copernicus portals, and so on, and serve it using the GDC API. The thick red line shows the viewer implementation. The server reads GDC data from the data store and serves it through Xcube's viewer API to the web viewer running in the user's browser. This diagram shows how we've deployed our components for the demo. To save time, we'll demo the server client and viewer concurrently, all configured to talk to each other. Each gray box is an Xcube deployment configured for one of these three roles. The red arrows show communication over the GDC API, so you can see that other server or client implementations could be swapped in here. We ingested some use case B data sets into object storage, which the server deployment uses as a backing store when serving this data via the GDC API. Two Xcube client instances connect to this server instance. One runs in a Jupyter notebook, which is a typical environment for Xcube. The second client connects to another Xcube server instance, which connects to the Xcube viewer via its own API. I'll demonstrate each component in turn in a web browser, first showing the server's HTTP endpoints directly, then the operation of the client data store in a Jupyter notebook, then use case data in the Xcube viewer. On to the demo. Here's the public uh, server deployment that we've set up with the open API page listing the endpoints that we've implemented. Going on to the endpoints themselves, here's the root endpoint of the GDC API. We can click through, for instance, to the collections list, probably the most interesting, um, and dig further into the collections themselves through this link network and get more details about individual data sets. So connecting this uh, public server to a client, here's a JupyterLab environment running on my local machine with the Xcube GDC client installed as a data store. So here we create a new data store within this notebook, connecting to that URL, URL we were just browsing. And we can then use the GDC API inf interface to this data store to list data sets, to get some metadata about them, and to get a data open parameter schema, which is to say this is then querying the API to find out what parameters are valid to supply when we want to get a, a data set. In this case, we're asking about the soil grids data set. So here, for instance, we can see a list of uh, valid variables in this data set. So using that, we can put together this uh, query to actually open a data set with a bounding box, a CRS, uh, requested variables, and so forth. But as soon as that comes in, we can examine that in the notebook. Here we can see we've got the bounding box we've wanted, we've got the variables we wanted. So uh, we can plot something from the soil grids, in this case, uh, clay content in the uppermost five centimeters in the use case B area of interest. So let's look at another use of that Xcube GDC client. In this case, the client is actually attached to another running Xcube server inst instance, which then feeds the data onto the uh, web viewer that we can see in this tab. So here you can see this is exactly the same data set. Um, we can use the interactive viewer features here, browse into the limit of data resolution, select different color schemes, different variables, but uh, there's no time dimension to this data, so let's pick something a bit more interesting. Here's the CMIP6 forecasts out to 2049. So here we can select, for instance, near surface air temperature. We can play that back at four days per second for the entire time span, or we can do other fun stuff like uh, picking out some user-defined areas 
on the map and letting the viewer calculate on the fly time series from those areas. So there's the Alps, there's a chunk of Western France, and uh, we should be able to see that France is a bit warmer in the coming years, as we'd hope. And um, that's unfortunately all we have time for today. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I hope you found it interesting. Thank you, Pontus. Uh, if you'd like to just introduce yourself and take a bow, is that, you know, we're, you're on the uh, webinar here, please do. Um, yeah, um, I think that uh, covered it all, but um, if there's any questions and if there's time for them, then I'm here. Well, there's certainly time um, to pose questions uh, in the question and answer uh, panel, and we will pass those to the appropriate expert to uh, answer either um, synchronously during this webinar or uh, we can also get back to people with more uh, detailed answers. So in the meantime, let's turn to the implementation work which URAC performed. And uh, this is, uh, I think, introduced by Michaela Klaus. Yeah. Hi to everyone. Uh, I think that the video contains everything, so you can just play. Very good. Here we go. Hello. My name is Michele Klaus, and today I'm going to present the work done by the team of Eurac Research, together with Alexander Jakub and Matthias Mohr, for the test bed 19 of OGC. We were involved in four different parts in this test bed, and here I'm going to present mostly the OGC API GDC instance and the data client. The GeoData Kit instance has been developed on top of the URAC OpenEO backend and it's available under dev.openeo.urac.edu. It's reproducible and open source and implementation can be replicated through the two main repositories available on GitHub. The data client we developed is called the GDC editor. It's a web-based tool and it's accessible at the link shown here and again the implementation is, is reproducible and open source. Now I will uh, show you the GeoData Cube editor in action connecting and interacting with different backends. This is the landing page of the editor. Now we just have to type in the URAC backend URL, press connect and then and then authenticate, in this case with username and password. But other authentication, method authentication methods are also supported. So this is the main view when we are connected. And now thanks to the wizard, we're gonna uh, perform a OGC coverage request. We select the collection we are interested in. We select the bounding box we want to get and uh, the temporal extent, so in this case somewhere in July 2022. Uh, here only the parameters that are supported are shown by the client. Finally we choose the file format, we decide to get a GeoTIFF, we send the request and then we wait for the result to come. Once the file has been computed, uh, we'll see that this preview panel is being opened up now we have a GeoTIFF which is rendered and you'll see that it's also possible to interact with the data and select which bands we want to show. Now we downloaded a full Sentinel-2 image with all the bands and we're going to show just the RGB bands uh, properly scaled so that they make sense. Okay, so now let's use the GDC client to connect to a different backend, the Gnosis one. We don't need to authenticate in this case. And here we are. We can perform again a coverage request. We select now the blue marble collection. We select random AUI, temporal coverage, and then we leave the other default parameters. And at the end, we select PNG as output file format. Send the request and visualize the result. We can also get data through the processes endpoint and not only through 
coverages. For instance, we select the same collection, the blue marble, and we drag and drop into the main panel. Then we just have to connect the collection with the render map process, modify the parameters if we are interested in. We can select an AUI or the US. Um, and then we just have to run the process and wait for the result. Again, we'll see it rendered on the right panel. And here it is. We need to mention that on the left side of the editor, we have the full metadata, which is exposed by the backend. For instance, for OGC coverages, we can inspect a single collection and check the description, the spatial extent, uh, and all the information that are exposed by the backend, also in a visual and more um, meaningful form. And uh, scrolling down, so closing the collections, part and opening up the processes part, we can also inspect the single processes metadata for OGC processes in this case, inspect the parameters, input out what they are supposed to do, uh, what we expect to give as input to the process and so on. Finally, we want to connect to the Geolabs backend. Well, we are going to show that uh, at collections and processes level, we can see and inspect the metadata of these specific OGC processes. And then additionally, in the bottom part, we can also uh, interact with the OGC jobs that has been run uh, previously and also uh, reload them, interact with them, check their metadata and also download the results. To summarize, we implemented a geodetective instance where we improved the existing OpenEO backend based on the Spring driver. We, thanks to the refactoring of the code, made it much more modular and with less dependencies. And also we added and enabled the OGC coverage endpoint. In terms of data client, we have now a web-based client which is capable to connect to OpenEO API and OGC API processes uh, seamlessly, and there's also the implementation of OGC API coverages, which is also enabled in the client. A possible next step could consist in to trying to harmonize the data processing among OGC API processes and OpenEO API, because they are still currently well distinguished. So, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Nicola. And uh, I just wanted to emphasize, if I can actually show you this. There we go. Uh, so it may seem that we just have a bunch of people who implemented a bunch of stuff um, independently and uh, are showing that. And to some extent, you're seeing that some clients are accessing servers from other participants, but I wanted to quickly show you what hard work <laughs> was actually um, precipitated by the number of server and client implementations in this activity. Uh, and a principal part of this sort of innovation work is looking practically at interoperability by looking at successful interchange. And so for uh, two servers and two clients, there's four different possible interchanges and it just goes up from there. So this was a lot of the work which was done in this activity, looking at the compatibility, interchanging data and requests operations between the different clients and servers generated in this activity. So uh, that in mind, let's turn to the next uh, client developer, which is Pelagius. And uh, I don't know, Glenn, if you're able to introduce yourself, otherwise we will turn to the video. Hey, Josh, uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm Glenn Lockwood. I'm based in uh, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. That's the eastern part of Canada. Um, and really enjoy working in this in this pilot. Um, there's a lot of really interesting work going on. As Josh talked about, the collaboration within the project was really effective as well. Um, 
from our standpoint, we're looking at this more as an application of the technology rather than you know implementing the technology itself. I think there's a lot of opportunity, not only for the Geo cubes, but integration with a number of the other uh, OTC APIs, um, which we'll talk about in this video. So go ahead, Josh. Thanks, Glenn. And here we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Cole Lachlan, and uh, I'm part of Pelagius Data Solutions, participating in the Tesla 19 uh, for GDATA Cubes. Um, a large part of my interest in this project relates to some of the work we've been developing as part of the Marine Domain Working Group. We're fleshing out requirements for marine protected areas to environmental monitoring as part of Tesla 18, or the impact of climate change in the Canadian Arctic. This project has allowed us to continue our work on these topics at scale. For this exercise, we focused in on one of the key essential variables of the Arctic, surface albedo, which is a strong indicator of a warming Arctic region. We know that the Arctic surface air temperature is rising twice as fast as the rest of the world, and its sea ice is retreating up to three times faster than the rate projected by climate model simulations. The decline of sea ice and snow cover in the Arctic Ocean leads to a decrease of the surface reflection and an increase of absorption of solar radiation, which in turn increases surface temperature and sugar sea ice decline. This surface albedo feedback loop is one of the major drivers of Arctic amplification and a strong indicator of a region in transition towards an ice-free environment. Working with the Rastamon group, we set up a pipeline in which we ingested the Arctic regional uh, reanalysis data sets from the Copernicus data store into the Rastamon GDC instance. Uh, this data set is a, a circumpolar region uh, including Greenland, Labrador Sea, and Davis Strait, and provides a baseline of observations with which we were able to then publish spatial and temporal, temporal characteristics of the region and perform analysis supporting some of the key essential climate variables for the Arctic. As apparent in today's demos, the concept of a geodata queue for analysis over both space and time is a very powerful mechanism. The inherent capabilities and proposed standardization present advanced users with a framework to develop some very complex spatial and temporal analysis, uh, both for environmental monitoring and machine learning use cases. But outside of this, it's important that the approach taken fits well within existing OTC standards. And in a best case scenario, provides these features, but packaged in a tight framework for the use of, by the rest of us. So using the Geo Data Cube concept for climate monitoring runs parallel to a lot of the work being provided by the MetOcean Group of which the environmental data retrieval API is a cornerstone. Now, Chris Little has done a great introduction to the benefits of EDR, so I won't go into the details of biscuits and crates, but rather just demonstrate the compatibility of the GeoDataCube framework with the API. The approach we took was implement the GeoDataCube interface as a provider inside the PyGeo framework. This project has a lot of features and is based primarily on the concept of a plugin provider that implements one or more OTC services. In our case, we extended the X-Ray and RASTRIO providers to support an implementation of GDC, effectively using EDR as a facade to the GDC API that provides similar capabilities, including slicing, filtering, and trimming across a multi-dimensional cube. So a basic example allows the user to slice the GDATA cube at a specific point in time and trim the cube back to within a certain area of interest. In this case, we're looking at the observed surface albedo at the spring equinox in 2019 and centered around an extent that includes a key protected area in the Arctic Circle, in the Canadian Arctic, sorry. The next example, the next example allows us to then use the GeoCube API to compute the difference in surface albedo between 2019 and 23. In this case, we're overloading the instance ID for the collection to name a specific query or process graph for the execution by the GDC implementation. And by this, we can see that over those years, there has been a severe increase in surface albedo recognized in the southern region. And last, the same query, but parameterized for near surface air temperature can be thrown at the ACER Genosis platform with no impact to the EDR client. So in this case, we'll just do a quick demo of using the EDR API as part of um, a basic Jupyter notebook. Um, in this case, we just set up the environment um, running against a local EDR service provider. 
uh, we go out and using the um, Arctic Council's CAF um, data service, we can provide, we can go out and get the particular areas for uh, an area of interest. Um, and the, so, yeah, so in this case, we just grab that and build an extent around it and then formulate the uh, equivalent EDR query um, that we'll then throw at the EDR instance. Um, in this case, we're requesting the response in NetCDF format so we can do some further analysis. Um, in this case, we grab it, we open it, and uh, we can introspect it from a data set standpoint, or we can visualize it um, using some basic tools. Some of the challenges that we had within the project itself was a coverage JSON itself. Um, I have some scalability issues with it for large spatial temporal data sets. Um, and there's a question of consistency uh, for non-aerial coverages. So abstracting the GDAQ platform behind an EDR provider interface allows us to use the PyGeo APIs, the clean set of APIs, independent of the implementation detail for each platform. Um, my interests revolving around observation systems. I haven't been able to figure out how trajectory-based observing systems, such as the NOAA Sail Drone Program or the ISAT-2 satellite mission, are easily integrated into the GeoData Cube concept. Uh, that's something to continue to work on. I didn't evaluate in too much detail the impact of long-running processes on the EDR workflow. Um, there are means to redirect the user requests in a sync process uh, using the response header. I'm not sure that's the right answer, just a good enough approach. Um, and last, there's a tight coupling uh, between the work of this pilot with analysis-ready data sets. And I'd like to see these two concepts aligned in the proposed standard and or expanded into the coverage specification itself. But with that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. And if there are any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Len. Uh, that's uh, the work that the lab just did, looking at uh, diverse areas of interest and phenomena and connecting that to the geodata cube concept. Uh, next up, we have work done by Wuhan University. And I will pull up the video if someone would like to introduce their team. I'd be happy to have that before or after the video. Uh, Louder, louder, please. Well, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, better. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, no other introduction. Uh, please play the video directly. Thanks. Very good. Thank you, and thank you for your team's hard work. Let's start to the video. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Testbed 19 demonstration and outreach event, where we showcase groundbreaking interoperability and collaboration from oceans to space, featuring GeodataCubes technology by Wuhan University. Today, we will present the innovative GeodataCubes initiative and its integration through OGC APIs and data clients. In the big data era of Earth observation, we are motivated to tackle the critical issue of interoperability among GeodataCubes, GDCs, striving to define and refine the GDC API through agile methodologies and develop client applications for effective data management and analysis. The architecture of our implementation enhances the management of geospatial data, facilitating the transformation of diverse raw data into a structured, analysis-ready format, and seamlessly integrating storage and service modules for efficient data retrieval and processing through established APIs. The deliverables from the D111 OGC API GDC, including OGC API Common, Stack API with CQL2 filtering, OGC API coverages for data subsetting, scaling, and field selection, and OGC API processes for enhancing core geospatial workflows and chaining. D113 Data Client enhances geospatial data interaction with support for OGC and Stack APIs, focusing on efficient data subsetting, field selection, and advanced processing workflows, including synchronization via the OpenEO API. We leverage detailed data sets such as Copernicus EUDM and soil grids for the rhine moose Delta, alongside Sentinel-2 imagery and ECMWF climate data, processed with specific aggregation. Our project focuses on improving how different geodata cubes work together, using a new GDC API to simplify the process, 
and developing a new API profile that helps in better data handling, adding value to the OGC standard for broader use and future adaptability. Thank you for joining us today. We hope this presentation provided valuable insights into our GDC API and its capabilities. Please watch our demonstration video next. Firstly, the GDC API endpoints we have implemented can be viewed in Swagger, which includes two components, data access and data processing. The data access component includes the stack API and coverage API. You can view the metadata information of the cubes we have published, which include digital elevation model, remote sensing imagery, and meteorological data, among others. And it supports dimension queries to retrieve the data of interest. The processing component primarily implements the process API, you can review the processing applied to the cubes we have published, including band calculations and aggregators, among others. It supports asynchronous execution of individual processes, as well as nested workflows. Additionally, it supports outputting the results using the coverage API. Next is our data client, which is built on the spatio-temporal computing platform, the Open Geospatial Engine, developed by Wuhan University. The online platform supports accessing and processing cubes through the coverage API, Process API, and Open EO API. Firstly, there is the Data Access module. Choose an endpoint, and you can view the list of cubes it has published. Selecting a specific cube allows you to view its metadata information, including data description and dimension details. The platform supports band selection and spatiotemporal filtering to retrieve subsets of interest from the cube. After clicking Submit, the retrieval results can be visualized on the map. In addition to retrieving 2D or 3D data, the platform also supports queries for 4D or ND cubes. Taking the meteorological data products provided by Wuhan University as an example, they include various variables and additional dimensions. You can perform dimension queries on these dimensions. Leaving them unchecked indicates that the default dimension values will be used. The retrieved results are also visualized on the map. Next is the processing module, which supports the OGC Process API and OpenEO API. Select an endpoint from the integrated list, and you can view the available list of processes provided by that endpoint. Selecting a process allows you to view its metadata information, including a description of the process, input details, and output information. You can input the request body in JSON format to execute the process. You can choose to execute in either synchronous or asynchronous mode, as specified by Process API Part 1. After a short wait, the execution results will be visualized on the map. In addition to that, the platform also supports using the coverage API as the output for results. Taking Wuhan University's endpoint as an example, input a nested workflow, click the collection button, and receive a virtual cube as a result. You can view the metadata information of the virtual cube, including band and dimension details, trigger the workflow execution through dimension conditions, receive the computation results, and visualize them on the map. Finally, demonstrate the platform's support for the OpenEO API using the endpoint implemented by Razdaman as an example. We can view the list of available processes and detailed metadata information for a specific process. This includes process description, input, and output information. Enter the process graph in the JSON editor as the request body for the process execution. Currently, only synchronous execution mode is supported. For computation results without coordinate information, such as PNG or JPEG, a separate component will be used for display. The presentation has concluded. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Wuhan, for that presentation of the Wuhan server and client activities in the testbed 19. Uh, next, we're going to turn to FCU uh, from Chia University. Uh, how, if you're able to uh, uh, speak up, uh, just to give a quick um, oh, overview of the work that uh, FC was able to do on their client. Okay, uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, before I start, I want to apologize that I couldn't prepare a demo video in time. So I will just give a brief uh, summary about our work. Uh, the FCU, uh, we are responsible for developing one of the GeoDataCube data clients. And throughout the development process, we utilize open layers as our primary library for the WebGIS front end framework and data visualization. And our functional uh, design was aligned with uh, GeoDataCube API drafts. 
specification that developed for this test bed. Uh, and we uh, successfully employed the uh, standard to access data from GDC APIs that developed by various participants, including Eurac, Resumen, Wuhan, Azure, and, and Brookman, and so on. Although there are slight difference in the implementation method for uh, of each participant, we were able to demonstrate that uh, GeoData Cube's capabilities in accessing metadata across endpoints, interpreting data services, and more importantly, analyzing and handling data in both synchronized and asynchronized approaches. So overall, we were convinced that uh, Geotech API has a great potential for further development during the implementation. And that's our summary. Uh, that's the summary of FCU. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Hao. And uh, just a reminder that the uh, we will, I think, be able to make uh, videos available afterwards. Uh, as well as the engineering report and the draft specification. So uh, you can dwell, delve more into the work that was done and the work which is recommended to uh, be performed in the future to better flesh out and make relevant this uh, API work. So uh, thank you to everyone who's stuck with us so far. We just have a few more presentations to do. We'll turn next to uh, Rastaman. And I don't know if we have a quick hello. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, Josh, you can just play the video because I included everything in it. Very good. Thank you. Well, just say hi and introduce yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Dimitri from, from the Rosamo team. Very good. Here we go with the video. Hi, everyone. I'm Dimitri from the Rosamo team, and I will present the work we have done in Testbed 19. Um, technically, we implemented the OGC Geodata Cubes API specification on the backend side as part of Rosamo community. Um, Rosamo community is, a, is an open source software which is an OGC reference implementation for coverage services and recommended for Inspired WCS. The GDC API implementation will remain in Rosamo beyond the testbed. In addition to the technical implementation, we have prepared and made available several analysis ready data cubes for the three use cases. These can be accessed through the, through the new OGC or GDC API but also through the existing uh, interfaces that Rasmo supports, namely OGC WCS, WCPS, and WMS. As the GDC API is quite extensive, we didn't implement all the future features. Besides um, general functionality, such as authentication service uh, and data discovery, um, from the core features, we support uh, the OGC API coverages and open EO processes, both predefined and uh, user-defined. And from the Open EO part in particular, we support synchronous uh, process execution, but not the async batch jobs. To show how this uh, works, I'll use the GDC client developed by Euroc. So we have uh, the URL to our GDC service. You can connect to it and then enter the credentials for authentication. And now we can uh, put um, an example um, request, open EO request um, that uh, I have already prepared and uh, this gets parsed into visual model uh, query tab. Um, what this does is it calculates wind speed from the U10 and uh, uh, V10 um, wind component bands from the Euro 5 data set. We also uh, subset the data, the data cube temporarily at a particular um, point in time. So we get a time slice. So the two bands are um, squared to the power of two. And finally, we calculate the square root of their of their sum. And uh, we save the result um, as PNG. So let's run the query. And um, yeah, we get back a result that looks like that. So we can, uh, we can um, modify this a little bit um, just to show that um, changes are reflected um, in the result. So if we remove the the power uh, operations and rerun the query, um, we get something else. 
let's look at the collections that we have on the on the testbed 19 node we see a lot of um, uh, different um, local um, data cubes um, but also there's a lot of um, IDs that start with the domain name such as this one here Creodius artserver.xyz and these come from nodes that are federated to the um, to our um, testbed 19 VM this is a feature particular to to Rasdaman um, and allows us to transparently um, connect different nodes and, and use data from from different places um, I'll switch to our own client now in order to show the data better on, on a globe interface um, we already saw the Euro 5 data which is uh, global hourly data over land from 1982 to, to present day the CMIP 6 uh, data is uh, climate projections for several variables covering the um, period between 2015 and 2049 uh, here we can select uh, multiple time slices and they'll get displayed um, then we have several um, uh, Sentinel um, data Sentinel 1, 2, 3 and 5P and these are over Europe and updated daily um, as data becomes available the soil grids uh, data cube uh, is uh, soil property maps at several depths and um, world cover um, is a land cover product for 2021 and the last the last four here are CLMS uh, data sets uh, for water wetness uh, imperviousness tree cover and grassland um, and they are over Europe uh, as well on this occasion it's relevant to also show maybe some some WCPS examples um, because internally it's um, what finally is evaluated in Rusdom and as, as GDC um, uh, requests like OpenEO and OGC WCS as well are translated to WCPS in, in Rusdom so the first example here is, is exactly the same as what we um, <coughs> did previously on in the um, OpenEO editor uh, that allows us to calculate wind speed from the Euro 5 uh, data it looks like that um, then we can we can um, try to do something with the EU uh, DEM data um, elevation uh, model data uh, that we access from another server and this server actually doesn't exist so I have to update the query here um, and um, then this uh, is scaled so it can be shown nicely in the browser we can do another federated query where we access Sentinel-2 bands and we put them in the red, green and blue channel to achieve uh, a false color image that looks something like, like this in summary, we implemented core parts of the GDC API for data cube access and processing and we made available a variety of data sets to facilitate the testbed scenarios as well as usability testing as an outlook, i would bring attention to the OGC and ISO standard WCPS like GDC, it addresses data cube processing with very similar capabilities with the key distinction that WCPS is a protocol agnostic declarative query language that is easy to write and, and read so we think that adding WCPS as an alternative to OGC API processes and OpenU would be a benefit for the GDC specification and that concludes my presentation thank you for your attention well thank you very much uh, for the contribution from Raz Daman and uh, We'll turn now to uh, GeoLabs. Uh, Gerald, uh, please introduce yourself and uh, let me know, do you want me to just show both videos in sequence or do you want to talk to your slides? Hi, Joshua, thank you very much. If you can uh, simply read the video. I will do that. Let's see. Uh, slides. And here we go. Hello, everyone. I am Gérald Fonroy from the Geolabs company. Today I am presenting you the result we got during our participation in the Geodata Cube task, part of the OGC Testbed 19 activities. Our goal was to provide an open source Geodata Cube API server instance prototype. We based our work on the Zoo project platform which is an open source OGC API processes part one core reference implementation. 
It is based on a zoo kernel able to interact with various processes kind. With this first prototype, we were willing to demonstrate that an OpenEO user-defined process can be deployed using the OGC API processes part to deploy, replace, and undeploy draft specification. A dedicated Docker image was made, including the Open Data Cube and Dask dependency. We created, we created uh, some processes such as GDC list and GDC index to list available collections or indexing new data in these collections. Dask was used to execute OpenEO user-defined process. The part two draft specification defines three operations as shown in this crosswalk table, deploy, replace, and undeploy. An OGC application package is a document comprising a process description and an execution unit. On the left, the process description contains the metadata information about the process, while on the right, you can see the OpenEO process graph encoded as an execution unit. You can see the video demonstrating the deployment and execution of OpenEO UDP online using this prototype server instance. This prototype server instance lacks support for OGC API coverage and offers only a limited number of processes. Announcements, announcement is required in the way the zoo project handles the nested processes execution for being able to add the a load collection process, for example. The OpenEO requirement class need to be included in, a draft specific, in the draft specification. The second prototype server instance is also is available online. It gives you access to more OGC APIs, including OGC API processes part one core, OGC API features part one core, and part three filtering and SQL, and OGC API tiles part one core. The Zoo project was associated this time with EO API. The account, man the account management requirement class uh, from the GDC API more specifically for the OpenID Connect was included in this prototype server as a process. We integrated multiple API like EO API Stack and EO API Raster and integrate them in a single Open API. This prototype lacks of OGC API coverage support as the previous prototype, but offer a single entry point to multiple API. More integration work is still required to take full advantage of the EO API. This is all for me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Gerald. Um, we can show the demo here now. Um, this open API showcases the Zoo Project OGC API processes server implementation. It illustrates deploying OpenEO user-defined processes using the OGC API processes part 2, deploy, replace, undeploy draft specification. As described in the exposed OpenAPI, some endpoints require authentication. You should use the OpenID auth authorization method and set the client ID value to Zoho secured client. You need to authenticate using your OGC GitLab user account. From slash processes, we can list the available processes offered by the server implementation. We can note that all the processes listed here have a mutable attribute set to false. Specifying that these processes cannot be managed using the OGC API processes part two draft specification, but only part one standard. Initially, there are seven processes available. The OGC API processes part two defines that we can use the post method on slash process to deploy a process. In this demonstration, we will use an OGC application package document. It is a JSON object made of a process description and an execution unit. For the execution unit, we will use an OpenEO user-defined process. When you click on execute to invoke the deployment of the process, you get back a process summary corresponding to the deployed process. If we go back to the processes list, 
we should find one more process summary and get a total of eight processes. Now, let's try executing the OpenEO user-defined process that we just deployed using the OGC API Processes Part 1 core standard. When we press the Execute button, the response provided is a status information document containing a job identifier. We can copy it to use as a job ID value on the slash job slash job ID endpoint. From there, we get the status information about the job we run. Now that the job is over, we can use the same job ID to access the result of the execution using the slash job slash job ID slash results endpoint. There's the demonstration of the uh, uh, open source prototype from uh, Geolabs and uh, very much connecting the Zoolabs processing platform to this idea of the GDC API. I think it emphasizes a, a challenge that I think this task identified, but you know, remains to be solved, which is that there are a number of means of defining processes and many engines for executing those processes. And how can we put those on a platform independent and uh, common basis so that even if you're using a workflow or process definition language, someone else can use the process that you define in a GDC API with some other data. So that uh, type of interchange or interoperability, uh, there was definitely some experimentation, particularly using this uh, developed concept in other test beds of an application package and uh, that is some of the work that remains to be done. So we have two more presentations, hope you'll stick with us. And this was from uh, an evaluation part of the activity, uh, both 52 North and uh, Synergize Planet worked on the usability of the API versus the, some of the requirements that came out of the sponsor use cases. So let's turn to uh, 52 North first. Uh, let me pull that up. Uh, Let's see. That is going to be a PDF. So, um, Benjamin, can you join us? Yes, I'm here. Do you want me to present? Uh, I'm going to pull up preview. Uh, no, I have your slides. So, All right. just let me know how I should switch them. Are we still see the Geolabs slides? Uh, we should be showing your uh, PDF slides. Have they switched yet? Mm. I see no Benjamin's problem. slides and PDF. OK. Oh, no, I see it. All right. Yeah, so I'm on the overview slide. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, let's, let's switch. I mean, it's, it's already dark here, so <laughs> uh, forgive me for not switching on my, my camera. Um, right. So, um, yeah, I will quickly present you the um, results of our. Um, work in the testnet 19. Um, so um, our, our task was to test um, the um, prototypes um, and also the specification um, for ease of use and technical usability. And as we um, worked um, with um, yeah, data cubes in the past but um, didn't have um, a client or server implementation um, for testnet 19, um, yeah, this qualified us um, to work on this. So, um, the next slide, please. And what we proposed and uh, then um, also delivered um, was um, an executable test suite 
um, for the uh, draft um, uh, API QData cubes. Um, and this, these test suites um, yeah, let you conduct um, systematic tests um, of, um, of service implementations. Um, um, our test suite is based on um, the team engine, which is the um, OGC, uh, let's say, test harness. And we used um, um, SNG and um, Java um, to create the tests. Um, we implemented 17 tests um, from scratch. And um, this is also something we wanted to investigate um, how we could um, use um, tests from, from existing um, test suites, you know, because the um, Geodata Cube API, um, as we have seen, um, yeah, consists of um, several um, um, API building blocks. And for some of those, um, there um, um, are already tests available. So if you go to the next slide, um, talk about the um, yeah, conformance classes um, that um, the test suite consists of. Um, we have the following um, conformance classes implemented from scratch. Um, the capabilities, um, you know, things like um, what we have seen, the landing page, uh, service description. Um, then we have account management, um, where we implemented the basic auth. Uh, conformance class, the data discovery and access is covered, as well as the process discovery and um, the open EO conformance class. So um, not every um, of this um, conformance classes is covered um, completely, but um, we have a solid basis, I would say, um, for the tests. And then um, we looked at the existing um, test suites um, that are yeah, more or less um, uh, are part also of the GeoData Cubes API. And there we were able to reference tests from the um, API processes core, the coverages core, and also the features core. So um, if you go to the next slide, um, some Challenges um, we, um, I guess we and um, the whole the whole um, um, threat, uh, let's say, had was um, of course that we needed a stable draft version of the GeoData Cubes API, so that um, yeah the server managers could start uh, working on their um, services, um, but that was. Um, I would say relatively quickly um, the case. Um, so um, we also um, could start early with um, the test suite. And um, as I said, um, we had to um, find a good way to include existing um, conformance, conformance tests um, that come with um, their own preconditions. Um, you have to find a way to um, include this into our um, GDC um, test suites. So we yeah, are next slide, the first scenario, um, as we really did more um, the functional tests, um, this um, uh, didn't really apply for us. I guess my colleague um, will talk about that in a minute. Um, then it, uh, let's go to the next slide um, with a summary. So in case you're wondering why, there are no test results here. Um, of course, we tested every um, implementation that you have seen before, um, and um, we covered the results in the um, engineering report. So I would refer um, you to that. Um, also, because um, implementations are still um, changing, and um, we want to um, conduct, uh, let's say, a final test and then update the results in the engineering report. Nevertheless, um, yeah, so the whole OGC API standards um, um, concept lets you really quickly create um, executable test suites that um, 
was something we um, yeah were able to to confirm. Let's say um, also um, the reference to existing conformance test um, was fairly easy. Um, we um, just needed to um, modify a couple of um, Java classes. Um, and um, yeah, you can see uh, more details in the engineering report as well. One thing we found out that for some of the reference conformance um, tests, there's an um, open API document needed. Um, and that was still lacking, I guess, for some of the um, implementations. So our recommendation would be to um, yeah, to create such an open, open API document. Um, to identify endpoints and um, the re request and response schemas. Um, right, and that's it for my side. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Um, and then last but not least, let's turn to uh, Synergize, a part of Planet, uh, for usability testing that they performed. Uh, Mika, do you want to uh, talk to slides or shall I just show the video? I don't have a video, so please. Uh... I'll talk to two slides. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, there we go. Right, thank you. Um, next slide, please. My name is Micha Kadunz. I come from Synergize, now Planet, and I will present our work on the GDC API usability test that we perform as part of Testbed 19. Next slide, please. The purpose of the usability test was to test the usability of the draft uh, GeodataCube API and its meta metadata model as exposed through the prototype clients. Uh, the scenario that we chose, next slide, please, uh, was land parcel NDVI time series scenario. Uh, this is uh, a processing chain that we often use and e execute as part of the agricultural area monitoring system that we operate in several European countries. So we know it very well, and that's why we chose it as the scenario for implementation. The input into the scenario is a geo package with some hundred thousands of uh, field polygons and uh, Sentinel-2 level 2A data for a whole year. Next slide, please. And the uh, processing change that chain that is executing on this data is uh, for each of the input polygons, we compute uh, the NDVI time series uh, for <clears throat> the whole year. This means calculating NDVI for every pixel, computing statistics over all pixels for that same polygon, and repeat this for each uh, observation in the year. Uh, in the end, we want to visualize those results uh, in a uh, graphical user interface by showing for a selected polygon the NDVI time series uh, in a nice chart. Next slide, please. The principles for usability testing that we uh, followed was uh, we wanted to execute the scenario in, uh, let's say, a hypothetical situation where a developer wants to uh, develop the processing chain from scratch. So the developer goes through uh, all three phases of discovery, implementation of the process, and uh, then execution in production of that same process. And uh, these phases repeat for each step in the processing chain. Uh, while doing this, we uh, the scope is uh, evaluating the APIs and not so much the maturity of the implementation because we know it's all prototypes. So uh, we um, want to uh, evaluate whether the scenario and the API are aligned conceptually and uh, whether the uh, API is easy to use uh, through the client uh, in all of the phases. And then along the way, we try to identify missing support of some required API functionality in the implementations or of other opportunities for improvements of the user experience. The means that we uh, use to assess uh, all of these properties of the APIs and clients is uh, some of it was through direct calls to the APIs uh, from a Python notebook uh, and most of the work was done through the GDC editor client uh, connecting to URAC and Resume server backends. Next slide please. <clears throat> the results uh, are 
available in the engineering report and I will not uh, read all of them. But to sum up the phases that we uh, went through is discovery of the coverage data set, uh, which went really nicely. We uh, wanted to visualize the coverage for a preview. Uh, listing available timestamps where we identified some uh, opportunity to maybe improve on that. Uh, implementing band selection and visualizing selected bands. Uh, those were all pretty straightforward. Discovering band math capabilities and implementing the band math also seems pretty standard. Uh, and then the more challenging things where we had more comments were the clipping data to a polygon area of interest, averaging uh, the data over that polygon area of interest and applying that process uh, over uh, the whole collection of polygons, which I said, there's uh, many hundred thousands of them. Uh, and in the end, we wanted to inspect the results of the processing, but uh, uh, reached uh, a, an impasse where the results that we have are basically a vector data cube, and that's not really uh, easily uh, supported by the clients that we were working with. Uh, to sum up, next slide, please. <clears throat> An important thing that we want to stress out out of this usability testing is the fact that developing processing change chains on server side uh, is significantly different than developing uh, on the client. So uh, the importance of error handling, handling metadata availability and debug debugging capabilities uh, is really needs to be stressed when considering uh, remote execution of complex processing chains, especially if those are still in the process of being developed. Uh, we also noticed some room for improvement in server implementations of the APIs, but we attribute this to the fact that those are prototype versions. Uh, so that's not a fault of the API. And we recommend, uh, as I mentioned, for the last step, some best practices for organizing collections and management when the data that we're working with are vectors. So that I, we believe there's an opportunity to uh, cross-pollinate with other uh, OGC <clears throat> uh, efforts that are dedicated to vector data. Uh, and uh, last but not least, we find that the draft GDC API supports uh, our scenario uh, and that the API is well documented and all of the pieces of the API are quite easy to use. And uh, we were really happy with the GDC editor client in its versatility and uh, efficiency when working with uh, geospatial data cubes and uh, specifically implementing the processing chains. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Mika. And uh, so that concludes our work uh, and our presentations today. We will uh, continue tomorrow, of course, and uh, let's just bring up what it is that we're going to cover here. Uh, Safari, there we go. So tomorrow, starting at 9, we have uh, introduction at 9.15. We'll go to this uh, affiliated topic of analysis-ready data. And Mika brought up this interesting issue that you know analysis ready data is a data model a format for data and metadata an api is a means of access and it doesn't necessarily imply a particular storage method he was discussing the issue of vectors that you can have a coverage which is an index to data which is stored in a completely different model such as vectors uh, but the implications of that remain to be worked out as the Geo Data Cube API continues to evolve and mature. And meanwhile, we'll talk about that data model itself uh, in the analysis ready data segment tomorrow morning. That will be followed by work in agile reference architecture and high performance computing. So I hope that all of you and the rest who've uh, uh, had to drop out to other things along the way will be able to join us tomorrow. Uh, Greg, Rachel, Sina, anything else? No, if anyone has any questions, they're welcome to send them to us um, directly, I guess you can. Uh, you can find us all on innovation on if you click that 
notion there. Uh, the contact us on um, innovation tab. And uh, if you have any questions, otherwise we will see you tomorrow, uh, same time as this as today. Very good. Well, I'll turn it over to you to uh, close us out then.